Welcome to episode 36 of the Friday Nightmares podcast. Today, we will be talking about politics and horror with a very special intellectual guest that's going to make Scott and I look smarter. But first, I already said his name. Let me bring in the Smoke Show, Crossford. Hey guys, uh, this is Smoke Show Crawford coming to you from Swartz Creek in the county of Genesee, in the state of Michigan, in the United States of America, in the North American continent, in the Western Hemisphere, on the planet Earth, in the Milky Way galaxy. I'm fully vaxxed, waxed, and ready to be called daddy. <laughs> fully waxed. That was the thing I held on to. Not that you're fully vaxxed, that you're fully waxed. Because <laughs> that's the most important thing. It is. And I, I don't think I gave my name. I'm Heather Powell, and I'm coming from Waterdown, Ontario. And I also wax, if that makes any kind of like, <laughs> I don't know, comparison. And I'm half vaxxed because I'm still waiting for my second vaccine. Do you, the question is, though, do you want to be called daddy? Do I want to be called what? Called daddy. Daddy? No. Yeah, because uh, as I said, I'm fully vaxxed, waxed, and ready to be called daddy. Oh, my God. No. If, <laughs> oh, Scotty. You know what? We need to stop having so many chicks hit on the smoke show. Like this, I can't take it anymore. Between this and Gremlins, uh, I'm going to be asking our guests to be the new host. That's what's happening. <laughs> this is actually an audition. I mean, it would be a better fit. Um, so coming in with us today is probably one of the smartest people I know. He is one of the most supportive people of other podcasts. He is a Legion original, as far as I understand. You may have heard his brilliance through the Psychosemantic podcast, the DD Clinic, or other guest spots that he has had. He is currently training to be part of the summer series, and he's going to kick ass. He is Mr. Darren. Welcome, Darren. Hi, thank you for letting me be on here. When you were giving those nice descriptors, I thought that I had shown up for the wrong day. Um, <laughs> but it, it's, it's a wonderful feeling to have your ego stroked like that by such wonderful people. And I'm happy to be here with you today. Well, it's all true. And I'm wondering if you can just give us a little bit, um, so the people who don't know you, maybe they haven't listened to you on the Legion Podcast Network, uh, a little bit about your background with podcasting and your shows. Yeah, so uh, let's see. Yeah, as you said, psychosemantic, V Clinic, uh, no long. Well, we haven't. It's like one of those bands that hasn't officially broken up yet. But also the the Midnight Horror Show with our friend uh, Duncan McLeish and Mark Ball and uh, Danny Trioxin and a couple other guys that don't exist outside other other podcasts. But uh, I always like to bring that up because we're trying to Duncan and I are every once in a while trying to get Danny to do a backup, but that, nice. that was just kind of a, I don't know if you ever listened to it, Scott. I um, did not know this one existed actually. Ah, yeah. You, you can probably find some old episodes. It's mostly, you know, four or five guys. Sometimes we had guests uh, just doing random weird fucking shit. But anyway, nice. primarily the psycho semantic podcast. I am one half of the VD clinic because my name starts with D and they needed to find somebody to take over for David when he left. And yeah, so I guess my history with podcasting was, um, you know, I, I was a, I got an English degree uh, with like uh, started a, as a focus in journalism. So when I graduated college, started a website and I did uh, political activism, political punk rock music. I like to interview people. So I had three episodes that you can't find anywhere. I, I don't even think I can find anywhere. And then I didn't do anything with it forever. And then I just started listening and becoming friends with more podcasters as things go. And then uh, really around 2015, I said, well, we can cuss on here, right? Oh, yeah. I don't know if you have a limit. Oh, fuck yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's no limit, I Darren. I figured I would just check just just to make sure I feel like Scott has a limit to how much you can talk about gremlins. That's the only limit on this show. Because if I have to listen to another fucking conversation about gremlins, I don't know. But Heather, the an the 37th oh. anniversary just came up of gremlins. Shut up, Scott. Darren's talking. <laughs> Sorry, Darren, as you were. No, that's all good. I just uh, realized that I was kind of ranting at everybody anyway in around 2015 when politics sort of got a little bit more energized and a little more scary for everybody and uh, in, in, uh, everybody concerned. So I just said, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start it back up. And I like to talk about movies and let's just have like loose conversation sort of thing. So psychosemantic, the tagline that I came up with that I think fits best is politics, movies, and political movies. 
We have all sorts of conversations, different people. I don't have a co-host, which is why I don't have a weekly show, because half of my time is spent finding somebody to be on the next episode, and the other half is finding something to talk about. And Makes sense. Yeah, we just sort of explore. It's non-genre specific, but there is a lot of horror, because horror and thrillers are things I watch a lot. And yeah, uh, I guess if you we want to talk about VD Clinic, that is partly literature. I did bring some more politics into the show as I do. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I love bouncing around. Like you said, I'm doing the summer series again. I've been uh, on the podcast under the stairs summer series since the 80s. And yeah, this year I've got 2010 and 2014. Nice. You've been a long hauler is what we're hearing. Yes, yes. I partially got in the back door from my uh, Midnight Horror Show connection uh, when Duncan started planning. He's like, hey, why don't you be on there? I was like, okay, easy enough. That's awesome. Well, Duncan's been in the game a long time. I recently became Facebook friends with Duncan, just recently. Um, and he has been podcasting, I think, at what? At least 10 years, I feel like. I, it, at least 30 years worth of content and however long <laughs> yeah. he's been doing it. That's Dude's awesome. a madman. <laughs> yeah, right. And to, to organize Summer Series alone. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of people who are listening to this have listened to Summer Series in the past. And if you haven't, you can check it out on the Legion Podcast Network. Um, but yeah, I'm, or podcast on the stairs is no longer on Legion podcast. Network. Oh, it's not. Nope. He went independent, uh, a couple years ago. All the single ladies. All the single ladies. Friend All of the, the network. Podcast. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Friend awesome. of the network. And he and Bo have so many shows together. You almost think he's still there. Right. Podcast on the stairs is under the P T putts collective if i'm not mistaken very cool well i do promo Bo and him when they do their slasher series i'm the official legion promo person if, if you ever get into the west world series you got to check out duncan and Bo go to west world Ooh, oh i like know i have to go back and listen to those that anything was, think, with Bo, i'll yeah. listen to because i also like to make fun of Bo. so it's <laughs> it kind of like it kind of just adds to it um but darren also you work with vanessa who is definitely one of the smartest women I've ever had the pleasure of meeting and uh, the two of you together is just fire. You on your own accord is incredible. Uh, the stuff that you've shared with me personally through messenger, like, I swear to God, there's times where I'm like, how is he so smart? Right. Did, and, and your ability <laughs> to analyze the information. It's not like you just find an article and you're like, Oh, look at this article. You're able to analyze what the impact is of what the article is talking about. And I think a lot of people struggle with doing that sometimes. They just like to share information without giving context. And you're really, really good at doing that. So I know that today you're going to be able to share a lot of context and a lot of information. And I hope everyone checks out your podcast because it really is something awesome. And yes. I think it's a little less eye rolly than people think when they hear politically slanted movie podcast. I, yeah, it... yeah I, I, and I think people need to not be afraid to talk about politics. If we didn't have a political system, our worlds wouldn't run and we need to understand them. And there is nothing wrong with having a discussion about them. I think the attitude of we can't talk about it is childish, to be quite honest. Yeah, there's just a good and bad ways, I guess, to discuss politics. Yes. Or, or uh, productive and non-productive ways. I like that. Yes. Another way. Right. Yeah, because your like because your show definitely helps teach because that's like I've learned a lot just from listening to your show constantly. And then I was very very intimidated that very first time you had me on the show because I was just like I don't think I'm smart enough to be doing this, but. I've, you know, it also was just first time working with you. So I was really nervous anyways, but like, yeah, I, you definitely are one to like make your guests feel welcome and not feel dumb when they come on. Like if they don't know a lot, like I do. <laughs> this, you this are the is, first I, to dumb, Scott. Well, I mean, but comparatively, you know, I didn't know shit about politics. Well, you really, have bad like, taste in movies, but you're definitely <laughs> not dumb. Hey, hey. If, if, <laughs> if you can analyze the world around you, you can talk about politics. It's yep. connected to everything and everything right. you do. So might as well know a little bit of something about it. That way you can, yeah. Anyway, get off my soapbox for now. <laughs> but, the training, but the training for summer series. So like before you start watching the movies, do you get a bottle of Gatorade? Do you get some <laughs> snacks? Like how, oh, you get a bottle of Gatorade, everyone. I'm right. Summer series involves training of Gatorade. So how many movies do you have to watch in total? Total, not just for my two years, yeah. uh, just by the end of the series. Yeah, for summer um, series, how many movies do you need to watch? 
Well, he's added more. Oh, so, good lord. <laughs> uh, so last year it was 20 movies on the final list, and each year had their own 10 movies that got whittled down to two choices. Okay. This year it's 12 movies per year, and you whittle it down to three. So then that's going to be, what, 24, 24 plus yeah. the remaining, uh, what, uh, if there's three for every year, that's 30. Oh, my God. Oh, wow, yeah. Yeah. So uh, 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 there are chances that some will have been seen more recently or recently enough. Mm. Because I, I I don't know. I mean, you can't predict how they go because they have the votes within the year. And then there's the People's Council and the Adjudicators, which last year I was comparing the adjudicators to the electoral college because it was just random going against everything everybody decided on just based on personal choice. Interesting. Um, so a fuck ton. I would say I have to watch a fuck ton of movies. <laughs> a fuck ton. I, I, I like the, that number. And I find the whole concept, like yet again, idea. how Duncan constructs this. It, you know what I feel like? I'm watching the all-stars of podcasting, only it goes on for a much longer time. Um, <laughs> and it requires probably more prep than it does at the all-star game. It sounds yeah, like probably. it's actually more work. The slam dunk contest of horror podcasters <laughs> would be interesting now. Right? <laughs> right? And um, I love when people can argue for a movie because I will have some debates. But at the end of the day, if someone's like, I think this movie is better, I'm like, all right. <laughs> I totally middle child it too right? by the end. Some movies I'll stand up for. Like, I battled hard that Wolf Creek was better than Devil's Rejects. Oh, Wolf and Creek. And I did so not good. win. Oh. oh. But I was beat out by a friend of the show, Dave Z. He oh, and I were okay. in the same well, year. And yeah, we got into the philosophical, which one would be better or which one would be universally more liked. And I gave in first. Dave Z does very, like you, he's very analytical with his films. He does look at it from a specific lens. I would be like, I like Wolf Creek because it's in <laughs> Australia. <laughs> and Rob Zombie's annoying. Stop having your wife in every film. <laughs> That's my argument. <laughs> like, I just, I don't, I I am obviously, I think I could maybe come up with a slightly better argument than that. But I think it's a tough thing. So credit to you for doing it and for watching all those films and, um, you know, preparing an argument that's solid. I think that's really awesome. Well, yeah, I think you're being not presumptuous easy. by saying I pre prepared an argument. But... Oh, okay, well, I, but flying by the seat of your pants. I prepared you, whatever works. Then you prepare to argue, and that's all that matters. I feel like my life is just making it up as I go. Every day I wake <laughs> up and I'm like, how can I fake it till I look like I make it? And that's my day-by-day -day occurrence. <laughs> like, no joke. Uh, Darren and I are also NHL fans, and uh, both of our teams suck, so it doesn't <laughs> Yeah, hired a new coach. <laughs> right. That's, well, yeah. um, you know what? There's always next year. I was actually saying to my buddy who's a Boston fan, he was he was razzing me about the Leafs. And I said, don't worry. The difference between you and me is I know my team's going to get a participation medal. You'll be joining us soon <laughs> on the golf course. And um, yep. they are, just so we know, Boston Bruins are on the golf course as well. And I said, but in all fairness, this like for NBA and for NHL, this wasn't really a real season. There was no fans, which I completely understand why. Uh, but it just didn't have the same razzle dazzle. Yeah, seeing those Vegas games with full the full mm -hmm. arena made me a little nervous. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It's it's nerve wracking. Um, I don't know what the case count is in Vegas. I've kind of stopped following the United States in their case counts because the moment CDC was like. It's all good if you've been vaccinated. It's a CDC, right? Is that what yeah. it is for you guys? Yeah. I was like, yeah. well, there goes the neighborhoods. <laughs> <laughs> I I just focus on Ontario, which is where I live. Um, but yeah, I, I look forward to a more hopefully semi-regular sports seasons um, come October. Fingers crossed. Hope. I have a feeling yeah. by then that's probably going to happen. Well, who knows, Scott? <laughs> I think but, at this point, no matter what happens, I think the I think at least our country is just gonna be like, fuck yeah, it, we're staying over. America. Open. <laughs> They're like, we don't give a fuck. Fourth wave. You can't fuck with us. We're done. <laughs> we're done. So true. You know, here we're like, all right, guys, we're gonna like patios opened yesterday, and like it was a big fucking deal in this province. People were out <laughs> hammering, getting drunk. Not me, because surprisingly I'm going out next weekend yeah. for the pride event. I had my homemade ally shirt. 
that I'm going to be wearing and I'm going to get fucked up. So it's going to be great. <laughs> yeah. I saw a political cartoon about people trying to get uh, tickets for a patio in Canada, like concert tickets. Is it really? Yes. <laughs> yes. In Toronto? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like it's a big deal because people are lonely too, right? Like right. I was in the dog park with my girlfriend the other day and uh, this dude was chatting us up. He chatted us up for like an hour and I, and you know, people are lonely. I don't think he would have probably chatted with us for as long if he didn't live by himself with just his dog and that was maybe the most socialization he had had in some time, right? So I think people are ready to get back and chat and, you know, be around people again. So just yeah, like I... Scott's ready to watch 2021 movies again at some point. Right. Ooh. One of these days, but yeah, I was going to say uh, briefly, like, but yeah, I can see where you're talking about, like with people wanting to get back to just doing stuff. Cause uh, I went to that uh, hometown days carnival last weekend and like, it's our little, it's our yearly tradition in this town to have like this, carnival like festival thing obviously it didn't happen in 2020 2021 though they waited till uh the because normally we have a more memorial day weekend but uh i think they decided to wait till our governor had announced uh everything outside will not have a limit on capacity of people and i think that's what they were waiting for and i also think it was the first outdoor event in michigan to happen after that announcement because dear god this my my town was packed full of people like I walked up to the carnival and I pretty much stopped and just looked at every, like looked at this massive crowd and I'm going, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with this. <laughs> this is too many people now. I'm not using this anymore. No, you were like, how many of these people know the smoke show? <laughs> how am in. I going to get shows through? Here. Smoke yeah. shows here, everybody. Don't worry. Don't fret. The party's getting ready to start. <laughs> Did you go home in time? See to how he lifts up his line? arm when he's doing that? Yes, he does. He's like the smoke he show. Does. He does. <laughs> like, he is really the smoke show. Like, people have even called him that in his personal life. So, right. well, and I, and I gotta say, it's mainly thanks to Darren, who, who's gotten the smoke yes. show moniker, like, the stick because of all the freaking uh, photoshops you've done on me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you created the legend. I just put it on the screen. <laughs> I'll say, Heather's the one that created the name. You've created the image. And now my ego is inflated. <laughs> <laughs> and now the Scott has taken over slowly but surely. So we'll uh, we'll break into our 2021 movies because I'm the only one that watched any because Scott is too busy playing video games and I watched his phone three. Line. Right, three. Okay. I, at I'm least actually... at least Aaron's being a real podcaster and hey, working on the summer series. You know, it's not it's not easy to be the smoke show and to run the sex line that I've been running. <laughs> true i really want to call it it'd be so funny <laughs> like i just picture you in like those tube tops at home and you're like hi everyone <laughs> it's friday night and i'm home here hanging out like those are the best commercials anyway we will get to our 2021 film and we'll get so. to we'll get we'll get to the smoke show hotline later yes we'll nine make nine sure nine we seven advertise six. it before we finish <laughs> yes nine Hot seven six God. number <laughs> right one eight hundred got smoke. Um, <laughs> so we'll start with the first movie, which I have you seen this one, Scott, or did you not watch it on my recommendation? I can't. I uh, I avoided it due to your recommendation and due to a lot of other people's recommendations. <laughs> yeah. So this was a theater release. Uh, Darren, have you seen this one? I no, because you've only seen Psycho Gorman, right? Yeah. From from this year, yes. Uh, well, especially you, in horror genre. Yeah. Well, I can I can save you some time, Darren. Don't watch <laughs> this one either. So okay. <laughs> This is a 99, 99, it's got 99 problems of being a good movie, ain't one. 2021 movie, and it's called The Unholy. And it is available on, in case anyone decides they do want to rent it, Google Play, Amazon Video, Microsoft Store, YouTube, and Cineplex. Um, Cineplex for Canadian viewers. It's basically like a movie that's based around um, the Catholic Church and the wrongdoings they have done to witches. And what happens when one witch comes back for revenge? And you can put it together from there. And see that the synopsis <laughs> sounds like it would actually be pretty decent, but it sounds so bland from what everybody's been it's telling. It's just me. it's very much like your average ghost religion movie. Yeah. And the CGI is a little painful. Was it entertaining enough to watch? Sure. For a free watch, because we did watch a screener, it was fine. Um, would I recommend people pay to rent it? 
you really like religious films a lot and you really like when the catholic church looks like assholes this might be a film for you Ooh, well then um, you got my interest oh. <laughs> yeah, like, i don't know with with some really cheesy cgi now there's some actually not bad actors in here the guy from the walking dead is in this the main dude uh jeffrey d morgan yep right um oh, okay the guy from the princess bride carl elves oh carrie ellis carrie elves william sadler so there's some decent actors like it's a well enough acted film but it's yeah i went to i went run out and rented personally i as i said unless you really like don't like the catholic church and you really want to see like what happened to witches if you're like oh shit that happened then yes i guess it's <laughs> it's entertaining enough um and now have you seen the next one scotty uh, yes, I have. I was the one that recommended this one to you. All right. Well, oh, sorry. I lose track. You, you just don't do a lot of work anymore. So. Oh, you. <laughs> so, sorry. Why don't you talk about this one then? All right. So the next film on the list is a uh, independent uh, anthology called Scare Us. And it's basically about a small town that's plagued by a return of an infamous serial killer. And while the this is all going on, there are a group of friends that get together, kind of like a book club almost. They get together in this library and they decide to tell each other scary stories. And uh, yeah, I would say this is just a fun little anthology. Like all the stories I thought were fairly entertaining. Um, I wouldn't say it's like amazing. You must see this. But at the same time, it's like I know. Heather's love for anthologies and like especially after doing our top five anthology stories I was like yeah you should check this out because yeah if you're a fan of anthologies this one's fun it's not it's not very memorable with the short stories but I would say the wraparound itself is actually pretty entertaining and kind of memorable like what did you think Heather? I think you've summed it up really well this is a low budget film that uses its budget well and it knows what it is the stories are creepy enough each story is creepy enough. Uh, some of them have more of a message behind them than others. That's definitely where they put their money into is some great practical effects. And I really recommend it. I really enjoyed it. I really like anthologies. And this will definitely up for an award for me for one of the best anthologies of the year. Wow, I didn't realize you liked it that much. Oh, nice. Yeah, I did. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really polished and well done stories and a good wraparound flow together what an anthology should be. Nice. Um, and should we, it's not uh, available yet on an, on my letterbox. So oh, okay. I'm assuming it but this might be something that's picked up by Shutter eventually. Um, yeah, I could see that. If not, probably the usual suspects, Google, YouTube, you know. Yeah, I have a feeling this one may get overlooked just because of the title, because how many scare me's did we have last year? And now there's a scare us. So people yeah. may not even think of checking for this one. And no longer just scaring one person, we're scaring all the people. Yes. <laughs> Everyone's pronouns are getting scared now. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. Uh, the next one is The Woman in the Window. Have you guys seen this one yet? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> well, it's... Uh, <laughs> Amy Adams is in it, and Amy Adams does a very good job uh she gary oldman's in it as well i didn't even recognize gary oldman it had been so long <sighs> for a free watch on netflix if you're looking for just like a murder mystery kind of deal it's enjoyable and you'd have really low expectations my understanding <laughs> is this is based off of a book so i don't know if the book is maybe better the ending and the whole movie is kind of easy to predict, to predict, but it is an easy watch. So I think if you have maybe someone who you want to watch a horror movie with, but they don't really like horror, they're more into mystery, I think this would be entertaining. Do I think it's going to be top 20, top 30, top 50 material? No, but I think it's a decent little mystery flicks. And right now it's just available on Netflix. I don't think, Scott, you've seen it, have you? No, no, this one was uh, one that I think you and Brandon were talking about. And I was kind of like, eh, I'm not gonna, doesn't sound like I should waste my time on it. Yeah, like it's a free watch on Netflix. So I think if you yet again, have someone like, I don't know, Darren, does your like, wife really like mystery films? Yes. Does she like horror films? Usually. Okay. She's so got to she be in the right, like right mood for it. But um... Does she like Amy Adams? <laughs> <laughs> I you know, I don't know what I'm trying to picture other things that Amy Adams was in. Was she in Enchanted? I think she, I think she yeah, was she the one was. in Enchanted because I yeah. like that movie. Okay. Yeah. Uh, she, well, she might like it. I've got her watching the Watchmen series right now. Okay. Nice. And uh, yeah, well, we, we picked something palatable. like we watched Us together. Ooh. 
And she liked uh, it, yeah. right? Oh, she's a big Jordan Peele fan. Mm, she has good taste. <laughs> I like that. Um, yeah, this is, I yet again, Netflix, free watch. It was fine, but definitely I would put it more as a mystery than I would as a horror film. So uh, the next one I know Scotty has seen because he referred me to it. Yes, um, but before we jump into that, I was gonna, I want to get uh, Darren's thoughts on Psycho Gorman since he did watch that. Oh, it was the goriest Mighty Morphin Power Rangers or Ultraman episode I've ever seen in my life. Right? <laughs> I, I thought it was fun. Um, I'm glad I waited a little bit because sometimes when people talk up a movie a lot, I grade it a little harshly. I did not really like that little girl all that much. Yeah, that I, seems to be the biggest complaint. I mean, it, it just seemed a little bit a little bit like she was, I don't know. I, I'm not really sure. But maybe it's just because I have memory. My, like, my older sister was nice, but I definitely had an older sister that did mean things to me. And I can, can imagine, like I said, with uh, The Gate, her fucking with me in the cross oh, yeah. behind my closet and stuff. Uh, it, it seemed a little bit like the character was trying to be like Louise from Bob's Burgers. But yes, maybe. that is a great comparison. Uh, but in general, it, it was a fun movie, especially a decent amount of stuff I've been watching lately is kind of heavy. And it is a good throw it on and just watch it kind of horror movie. Ah, that makes me happy because like you've known I've talked about this movie a lot and I freaking love it <laughs> from here in our show. Because <laughs> uh, that's just like my total jam though. <laughs> but yeah, I, I wanted I had to, to make sure thoughts. that I got it in before we talked. Oh yeah, that, that's awesome. I was saying, yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you for sharing that because yeah, I, I really wanted to know your thoughts on that one. <laughs> um, but it yeah, I guess it was, it was it was worth the time. Awesome. Yes, I feel vindicated then. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess I will jump into the one that we were just uh, that Heather brought up. Uh, the one that I had recommended to her was uh, called "The Sound of Violence," uh, where a young girl recovers her hearing and gains synesthetic abilities during the brutal murder of her family. And to find solace in the sounds of bodily, she finds solace in the sounds of bodily harm. Uh, so this is a really interesting story, um, where once again it's one of the, it kind of reminded me of Bliss in a in a way where the uh, protagonist or the character you were following, you really can't get behind, though you have a little more sympathy for her than the character in Bliss. Uh, but I thought this one had just some really unique kills, a very interesting story, and a pretty uh, messed up ending. <laughs> yeah, it's my number one movie. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. I think, and the reason why is because I really respect movies who take a different concept that we have not seen before. Yeah. And this concept of what this character is motivated by and why I have not seen a movie like this. Now, maybe Darren will watch this and I feel like he's seen a lot more movies than I have and he'll be like, yeah, there is something similar to this. But I just think that the practical effects in this, especially in the ending scene, were out of this world. Good. Yes. Um, it was clearly a movie that yet again did not have a high budget, but the acting was very good. The setup was very good. The main character you had mixed feelings for mm -hmm. which I think is a very good way to present a movie like this and it will definitely be in one of my top my top list of movies when if people will say to me I want to watch something different or unique I would say the sound of violence because or sound of violence because I just think it is what 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 you would be considering a unique artistic film with substance not making an artistic film because you can make flashy lights and loud music and staring at each other for an extensively long time <laughs> and believing that that's a good film. So I strongly recommend this film. If what we described is what you like, if you don't like it, that's fine. Um, I'm not here to tell you what to like or not to like, but I think I you am. should at least <laughs> respect the development and how it's made. And this is available on iTunes, Google Play, Voodoo, YouTube, Microsoft Store, and I think it's worth whatever rental you pay. I would own a physical copy of this movie, which yeah. for me, who doesn't own physical media, that says something. Yeah, and uh, yeah, because I haven't really ranked this one yet in my list, but it'll, at the moment, it'll definitely be in my top 10. Where exactly? I'm not sure, but this movie was just freaking awesome. It, was, it will stay in my top 10 this year. Very few movies will compete to knock this out. Yeah, I, um, I agree. The next one is the Saltwater 
the battle of ramry island oh boy <laughs> this is a low budget crocodile film filmed in world war ii hmm. uh it it basically talks about uh this troop that's abandoned on this island and there's a saltwater crocodile that's going to eat them there's some racial tensions that happen and i think they actually handle it well for being world war ii on what would actually happen within the british armed forces there's a gentleman that's from india that's serving with them and uh, uh some yes. issues occur and that probably did happen like i i think that they're not shying away from it the dialogue is good but it's a long watch this is sitting at a hour and a half so a 90 minute runtime and it feels like a 90 minute runtime it is available from uh google play both in canada and the united states voodoo microsoft store and youtube i would say that if you really want to like watch maybe some historical dialogue that would have occurred around world war ii this is a really good film but it's not really a horror film like okay. it's not or even a good creature mm -hmm. feature like they kind of just used Photoshop, right? Like pictures of like a documentary from a, cro a saltwater crocodile and like the water splashed a lot and people got dragged in. It wasn't anything super special, but if you like war conversations, then yeah, I think it's definitely worth your time. If not, I would skip this one. Um, and then we have the second one. Have you seen this one, Scotty? Nope. I almost started it today, but I realized the time crunch I was on and I was like, all right, I'll hold off on this one. Uh, the Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It 3 has come out for the, what does it call it? Wana universe? Yeah, the Wanaverse. The Wanaverse. <laughs> uh, it's fine. It's a Conjuring film. So if you like jump scares and if you like creepy things in the dark and if you like angry ghosts, you'll like this movie. So... <laughs> or demons or whatever the fuck it's supposed to be um you know what it's a conjuring film if you liked the first two conjuring films you will probably enjoy this film do i think it's one of the best movies that come out no did i find it entertaining absolutely i like how the warrens are portrayed whether they were truly like that or not i don't really care i can just separate it for watching this film um you know they they use a real case which is where someone is using possession as a, as a reason for committing murder. Whether this person was possessed or not, I don't really know. The movie definitely sides on that they were, but that's not a spoiler. Like it's pretty clear because the courtroom piece isn't that big of it. Like a lot of people have said it's a courtroom drama. They're in a courtroom for like 50 seconds. So I don't get hmm. where people thought this was a courtroom <clears throat> drama. Uh, but it's, if you like Conjuring films, and I, when I say the Conjuring films, I mean the Conjuring films, not the Annabelle films because I do feel that those have a different theme to them. Yeah, they you'll do. like this one. Yeah, because um, I'm kind of in between with the Conjuring films, but I always give them a chance. I think it's entertaining. Honestly, if you had a friend over and you wanted to watch something that was entertaining, you could throw this on, but it's very jumpy. Like, jump, yeah. jump. Like, I feel like I'm going through a haunted house and they're like, da -na -da -na -da -na -da -na -da the jump. The jump. <laughs> like that's what it feels like right like that's ah, fine that's a conjuring movie so it's available on google play amazon video youtube microsoft store and hbo max for all my american friends who have hbo max um yeah because yeah. i think hbo max has struck a deal with warner brothers to where any of their movies that go to theaters come out on hbo max at the same time a deal with the devil yes <laughs> the devil made them do it well warner owns hbo right or is it the other I, way around yeah it's something like that i'm not too sure on who owns who but they own each other's soul darren <laughs> <laughs> and then there's disney coming. yeah <laughs> hashtag capitalism um and then the next one is caveat have you seen this one yep Scott? this is the one that i watched today all right you talk about this one. Oh, do i okay this is a weird one uh <laughs> <It's> weird. <laughs> let me uh pull up the synopsis real quick because oh boy this movie all right so this is a, yeah, a shutter exclusive called caveat that was released uh i think about two weeks ago maybe a week ago but it's about a lone drifter suffering su suffering from partial memory loss who accepts a job to look after a psychologically troubled woman in an abandoned house on an isolated island. This one, uh, very interesting. Hard to uh, really wrap my head around with some of the things that happened because it's just dealing with somebody that has the partial memory loss. So a lot of things you're just kind of like questioning it along with the main character. Um, but I have to say this had some very very creepy moments to it mm -hmm. like they did a great job of building like this creepy ass atmosphere and just some of the imagery they show it was kind of unsettling especially uh there's a thing with a stuffed rabbit doll that is used in this movie and that rabbit is fucking creepy looking because it's all just old and kind of decaying 
but it's yeah i would say this is definitely something that i recommend people check out because it's gonna be it's not gonna be for everybody but this is one of those just kind of like supernatural horror films that has you wondering through a lot of it and constantly just keeps you on the edge of your seat because of how just unsettling a lot of the imagery is yeah i think you summed it up perfectly it's a very slow burn it's an 88 minute runtime it feels like an 88 minute runtime well acted uh well filmed very much uh plays on supernatural the ending was very much like oh yep. okay <laughs> Uh, so if you dig that kind of thing, if you like slow burns and the kind of like artistic ending, you'll dig this film. It is available on Shutter, and it's available on all the Shutters: Shutter Canada, Shutter United States, Shutter Amazon Channel, as well yeah. as AMC Plus. Yeah, so, but I even think for our uh, friends down under, I think it's also on the Shutter Australian. Oh, for those horror for dummy fools. Yes. <laughs> Yes, those silly, silly fools. Uh, we can't call them the other word that they like to call themselves on their show because we in North America, and we can't say that. Yep. Unless um, they're on the show, then we're allowed then to. Then we say it because <laughs> they're here. Um, but yeah, I, I think for a free watch on Shutter, I think you'll be at a miss. If you're looking to, you know, maybe you're only watching 50 horror films this year, I think this should be one of them. I think it's well made. It's an artistic film. It's a it's it does have some great acting to it, some good scares, and I think it's worth your time. Yeah, agreed. Like I am definitely not upset that I watched this film. I thought it was pretty entertaining. I'll say, yeah, but I'd probably it it might be in my top thirty. Because you know, Scott and I watch so many movies that we say things like top well, thirty. Well, <laughs> we we used to watch well, I used to watch so many movies like uh, by next year, top 20 may be a thing, and that'll be as far as it goes. <laughs> so I'll be like, I've watched 15 movies, and I have a top 20. <laughs> yep. I'm just going to guess from what Heather said where the other ones would rank. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> um, and then the final one is Ghost Lab. This is a Netflix international film, and I always have found that Netflix kills it with international films. Always. I enjoyed Hospital that came out earlier this year that was also an international film. Uh, Ghost Lab, I believe, is a Korean film. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I think it's a Korean film. It's 117 minutes long. Like, it's a long film. Like, you're you're packing in there. But it's basically about two individuals that witness a haunting and then want to find out what happens in the afterlife and Ooh. an experiment that they do. It's actually very well done. It's very creepy, Darren. You're no, you yourself and your wife might enjoy this movie. Uh, you can watch it dubbed or with subtitles. Uh, I feel like you and your wife would watch the subtitles. But if we people do want to watch it with dubbed. Sorry, what was that? We tried to do the subtitles whenever possible. Yeah, it just it causes a better flow, right? I'll use dubbing if I'm doing something else and I just want to catch what's going on. Uh, but sometimes the dubbing and, you know, what gets translated to English isn't the same as what it would be in the native language. It's a good film. I, I think if you enjoy ghost stories and hauntings, more realistic hauntings and question what would happen when we die, this is a very, very good movie for that. It's, as I said, 117 minutes. It's available on Netflix. It's an international film. I think yet again, if you're sitting to maybe, oh, I'm only going to watch 50 horror films this year, I think this should be one of them. If you like international films and ghost films, if that is not your thing, then you may not enjoy this. So don't waste your time. But it's definitely not a bad movie, but it is a long movie. That is one thing I've learned from last year, too, is because, uh, you know, I used to not be a big supernatural ghost movie person. But a lot of the international ones, especially from last year, were really well done. So I and I think it's just a lot of the American ghost stories are just typical boo, jump scare, boo, jump scare. You mean the conjuring? That's yes. the jump scare, jump scare. Yeah. yeah, the Conjuring and Paranormal Activity have yeah. pretty much shaped what our supernatural horror films are for the most part. It's true. And I found that Asian films, and I am putting Korean films, Japanese films in that same, and Thai films, they tend to be a more slower burn, which is going to actually go into what I was listening to uh, this week as well. But I, I think that it's just a different scare. And it's yeah. not that one scare is better than the other. Like I dig me a good jump film, jump scare too. Like that, it's not like those are beneath me. It just all depends on what you're in the mood for. Yeah, exactly. And I really like Spiral. Just to be clear, Spiral with Chris Rock is my favorite Saw movie. I don't care how that makes me sound. I don't love the Saw series to begin with. I think it is okay. And there's nothing wrong if it's your jam. But I loved this retelling. I preferred the cop drama piece of it. I enjoyed Chris Rock's humor throughout it. I thought it was funny. And yeah, it's predictable as shit. No kidding. Um, 
and the other ones were not the first watch for a lot of the saws you had no idea i will definitely give them credit for that but i just enjoyed the flow of this movie a lot more personally yeah. for me i was saying that's awesome because yeah I, I once again that was one that i you know i championed like and it felt like i was like running up a uh, hill covered in ice it was a losing battle until i like i'm glad to know others are with me on that one but i think like i said before it's people who are huge fans of the franchise will not like that film nearly mm-hmm. as much where people like you and i were, were like eh, the franchise is okay we'll like it a lot more how do you feel about Ooh. soft films darren I gave up after the third or fourth one. Uh, you might like this then. Yeah, I'll say you probably like this one a lot better then. Because yeah. <laughs> it's definitely yeah, a lot like better feel to it. The first one was cool. Yeah, I, I think I, I feel similarly to how you two are describing your experience with the with the series. Like by the time it got to the third one, it was always like the camera work was dun, 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 flash, 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 flash. And then like, I got so tired of the self-righteousness. You have not tipped your servers enough at the restaurant. So now you must decide <laughs> between whether you live or die. But you who's like committed murder for 15 people, you know what? That's okay. You who made a one-time error, you have not appreciated your life enough. And I really found Jigsaw fucking annoying. Like he sounded like the most annoying motherfucker ever. Like his <laughs> wife must have been like, shut the fuck up. Like, why do you have to be so self-righteous all the time? Now, mind you, I can't remember the actor who plays him, Tobin Bell. No, right? yep, yep. Great actor. He did an awesome job. It's no criticism to him. It's he's, you know, reading what's been written for him. And I enjoy the traps. I get the traps and that process of it, but the story is so convoluted and Mm -hmm. everyone buying into Jigsaw's way of life and this happens and that happens. And it's just, it's not my, my jam. So, so Darren, I recommend Spiral for you. I think you'll find it just a little bit more palatable. Yeah, I was going to say, that's a great word. Yeah wasn't your jam you know and that's not to yet again hit on saw fans if you love saw rock on i want to ride the saw roller coaster in england one day that would be a great you know hashtag dream but oh wait there's a saw roller coaster in england yeah in england yeah huh yeah you can find it on youtube i'll have to look into that interesting yeah i like my roller coasters i know you do you adrenaline junkie (laughs) <laughs> so we'll break into older films and we'll have Darren go first. Darren, do you want to share two older films that you're doing for summer series? Yeah, let's okay, two. Let's thank you for giving me a number because I wasn't sure how many. <laughs> uh okay. You said you enjoy Asian cinema. Yes. So have you seen a South Korean film from 2010 called Bedeviled? I have not. No. Uh, that one is about, I'm pretty terrible at pronunciation, and then my years of Spanish class show horribly translation of other languages. So Hei Wan, I will say her name is, is a girl who lives in uh, Seoul. Is that, how, is that how you pronounce the capital Seoul? of South Korea? So I think it's Seoul. Yeah. Seoul. Okay. She goes back to visit the island in the middle of nowhere that she grew up on and shitty things happen. It's it's there's some pretty real shit, I will say, especially for a woman to not go in there lightheartedly. I mean there there is uh it's one of those people are the real monsters kind of horror movies, not like uh ghost or you know, anything like yeah. that, which I tend to get more of a reaction from. Mm-hmm. With, with the people being the real monsters. Uh, I really don't, I'm not sure what all to say. You know, one of her childhood friends is there. There's re, revisiting the past, seeing what happens when lives diverge and when they come back together. Uh, yeah, 2010, Bedeviled. I don't know what its original title was. And I, I would say the second one, because there's some, I'm doing, I'm recording 2010 tomorrow, actually. So oh, wow. it's been a lot of 2010 stuff. Uh, so, you know, there's, yeah, there's some, some things you'd probably expect. And then let's say uh, Julia's Eyes or Los Ojos de Julia. Uh, I believe it's Spanish. Oh, wow. Have you have you seen that one? I had not even heard it's, of that one. No. It is definitely in Spanish, but I would feel bad if I got the country of origin wrong. But anyway, it is a woman who is... Uh, her sister had a degenerative eye condition where she went was going blind and she kills herself at the beginning of the movie. But the sister, who has the same condition, doesn't think that that's what happened. Uh, I don't know a whole lot of, I don't know a whole lot about. Well, it's yeah, it's it's like a horror thriller. Uh, I yeah, I quite enjoyed that. Um, that is 
let's see that is available i forgot to do that with the last one that's okay that one's available on uh amazon direct tv uh apple tv youtube awesome nice Um, i'll have to look into that one because that sounds very interesting i i quite enjoyed it yeah well we trust your judgment darren you know your shit yes yes you do I'm happy to see which one of you watched this movie I see on the list. Oh, so that's me. I have not watched a lot of David Cronenberg movies. I know. And I'm Canadian. It's a shame. I know. Shame. Like, <laughs> I was concerned about being deported, which is why. <laughs> and I don't like Tim Horton's coffee. So I'm really skating on the edge. Like how you What about Tim Bits? Though? Just... Well, and when I could eat Tim Bits, I can't because I'm celiac. But when I oh, could, fuck, I eat that right. shit. Oh, dude, I ate that shit all the time. It didn't matter that it made my tummy tummy sick. I lived for Tim Bits. Like, even now, it's like my friend's daughter will get Tim Bits, and she'll be like, do you want one, Auntie Heather? I'm like, oh, you know, like Auntie Heather can't have it. She's like, more for me. Like, it's just really like. Let me rub it in your face. You're lost. That's what you get when I'm five, and I don't give a shit. Um, but yeah, so I saw Rabbit, uh, 1977. The first hour, I was kind of like, eh, meh, 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 okay. But then it ramped it up, and I was like, holy fuck, am I watching COVID-19 all over again? just talking about the vaccines and then they were giving vaccine cards to people. So this movie was filmed in Montreal, which I love when things are Canadian filmed in Canada and acknowledge that they're Canadian. It really like gets me going, but this was just fucking awesome. I I'm that haven't seen a lot of seventies films for people who listen to our show. They know that that's my blind spot. And this was great. It it was no Italian seventies film, but it was it was really solid. Have you seen it, Darren? Yes. Uh, this is another film that I watched with the misses. Uh, nice. It was on Turner. Usually on uh, in October, Turner Classic Movies here in the states. I don't know if you have Turner Classic no. up in Canada. No, I know Turner is, but I like the it's they, Ted Turner, they, right? Is it his network? It it was. I don't okay. even know if he's still alive, but um. Like uh, one of the main hosts is uh, Ben Mankiewicz, who is, if you watch that movie Mank that came out last year, that was uh, the Oscar contender about screenwriter that worked on Citizen Kane. That's like his grandson or oh, his oh, cool. grandnephew. But they have the uh, but in October they really do a lot of old horror movies, and then you sort of feel old when they're like, "Yeah, this movie's from 1995." <laughs> <laughs> damn it (laughs) and you realize that's not like 20 years ago (laughs) right yeah Uh, so you know they usually do a lot of hitchcock and cronenberg classics and all that other fun stuff so we watched it then or it was you know time's kind of been a a flat circle as (laughs) as they say in uh true detective uh so i can't exactly remember i've watched a lot of movies like you were talking about this is COVID all over again I almost suggested we do the crazies. Yeah. That, yes. that felt a little like, oh, okay. <laughs> either yeah. one, either crazies. Yeah. And yeah. So I, I'm pretty sure I revisited it at some point during the, the paranoid times in which we are in at the moment. What I really liked we about. Definitely watched it together. Well, what I liked about Rabbit was the vaccine thing. And having vaccine verification, because I'm pretty sure, well, Canadian, the Canadian border, well, when it opens and the American border, we will only be letting Americans in that are fully vaccinated. So I thought that was interesting. So there's going to have to be something on like Scott, when he comes to visit, will have to have his card, I assume, short to the border guard along with his driver's license because he has enhanced license to be like, yes, I am vaccinated. So he's able to go into the country. So I, and I imagine that for Canadian citizens, there's going to be travel restrictions if you're not fully vaccinated. Um, So I thought that was really interesting in that movie in 1977. And I was like, wow, here we are talking about that. And here I am watching it from so long ago. Yeah, this is... This is one that I need to revisit because uh, I watched it for the first time probably about, I'd say, six, seven years ago, and it just didn't hold my attention. And I think it was like you were saying, that first hour made it so mm-hmm. I just kind of lost interest and I never and I've never went back to it. But I'm also this will probably piss off a lot of people, but I'm also one of those that thinks that Cronenberg is a bit overrated. Like, I know he's like he's a great filmmaker, but for his films, 
a lot of them don't hit with me. There's only yeah. a handful that really hit with me. Um, you're dead to me. But besides that, <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding, Scott. I think that you make a valid point. I think he is an incredible filmmaker for what he does. I think he does body horror very well. I watched The Dead Zone, which I really much enjoyed. I very much enjoyed. Uh, scanners, was, I really liked. I love uh, Scanners. Dead Zone, I almost picked for that for this episode. Yeah, it's a good film, but I think he is an acquired taste, much like mm-hmm. his son is too. Yeah, right. Like so, you know, I it's like any director, and I was in a debate on my other podcast about you know directors too, and it all is all going to come down to who connects with you, right? Yeah. Like at the end of the day, a, a director can be very solid, but if you don't appreciate the work then you don't appreciate the work to you they're going to be overrated because that's not your jam so and for me like you know this could just be uh something that i just need to go back and revisit a lot more of his films i think watching it now scott you'll have a different appreciation with what's happened in the world that's kind of what i'm thinking and uh just because uh for what we're doing for our patreon soon i will be rewatching it yes yes we'll have to plug that later on right (laughs) you know just making sure we're setting ourselves up for that layout. I mean, there. I'm great for a tease. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> At one eight hundred smoke show. <laughs> and like That's we would have to be time. like five ninety nine for the initial minute, dollar ninety nine for every follow minute. Um. So what you we've been listening. Bitcoin. To- <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Scott also takes Gremlin toys as payment. It's true, I do. And magic cards as yeah. payment as well. Oh, oh, some of those magic cards. Yeah. Someone give me a black lotus. I'll be good. Oh my God. <laughs> fucking magic cards. Anyway. Um, hey, a black well, lotus could buy you a freaking yes, house. Okay. I know. And there's like <laughs> magic cards that cost a lot of money in a deck and you never know what you're going to get. And it's just like gambling. Listen to controllers up cards down for more information <laughs> on Scott's magic cards and, and what he gets in the mail and how much he loves them. Please listen today. Uh, so what we've been listening to, Darren, did you want to go first with a show that you wanted to shout out? It doesn't matter what show it is. Yeah, I, I would say, okay, I, I would recommend since it's less known, I had two in mind. The one that's definitely less well known is a show called Dixieland of the Proletariat. And it is a couple guys and a woman or two uh, rotating down in Alabama, and they are communists, socialists, activists, union rights, like, uh, it's like Southern working class stuff. Uh, The last episode I listened to, I'm doing a little bit of catch up, but they were talking about the Wilmington race riots. Uh, They had, I don't know if you are familiar with, with what's going on with No Evil Foods, no. which is a progressive food company that did like Amazon style union busting and fired a bunch of fucking people. They had uh, people on that were trying to organize a union and they interviewed them. And that, I mean, for a while there, you couldn't even get that episode because No Evil Foods was threatening lawsuits to, and had, to have it taken down. And Oh, wow. Um uh, you know, it's, it's some white guys, some people of color, some women, uh, one of the regular hosts. I don't know if she's always on is uh, Native American. Uh, it's pretty eclectic. Uh, and the main host is like a poli sci master's or Ph.D. student down in Alabama. And it's a bunch of people he knows and they all get together and talk about different things. Sometimes they cover books, sometimes they cover history they do yeah it, it's pretty interesting and pretty cool and uh i like to support them and i learn a lot from them i would that's say that's awesome and are, where do you find them are they on spotify podcast addict where's the best place to locate them uh, i always listen to them on itunes or whatever they're calling themselves awesome. now oh yeah, yeah. nice uh, they're really fun on twitter awesome <laughs> Awesome. I dig it. I also respect the fact that they're from the South. Uh, yeah, and it, I feel like their values maybe aren't as common, you know, among it, it, some people. It does contradict a lot of uh, generalities people toss out there about the South. Right. That's good. We need to have our generalities uh, challenged. Too often, I even find myself making um, stereotypes. And, you know, to say that people are a certain way just because they come from a certain state isn't fair. That doesn't, you know, I don't have a, a an ability to talk to every single person from that state. Um, I'm going to give a shout out to Lance Lansford from Texas. He is probably one of the most, um, I want to say liberal minded, but I hope he doesn't take that offensively. I just think he's very <laughs> open minded and I think he's very aware politically of what's going on. And, oh, he definitely is. You know, and I, he lives in Texas, you know, like 
people will say to me, ah, oh, people from Texas. I'm like, you don't know Lance. Lance is very smart. And Lance has a very good idea of where his, um, where his values are. And he can back them up very well too. So I think it's important that we listen to people from different parts of the world that we may have stereotypes about. And we all have stereotypes. I know I have stereotypes. I'm guilty of it. Um, it's good to have them challenged. Yeah, absolutely. He's on, yeah. He's on the next episode of Psycho Semantic that I'm editing. Oh, Lance? Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah Lance, is, Lance is a really cool dude. And he's also very knowledgeable and he's funny. Oh, he's, he's hilarious. Personality. He's a really good yeah. personality. <laughs> Yeah, he's he's fun. He's been he's been on before. I think the first episode we did together was on Snowpiercer. Oh yes, really? that's right. That's awesome. So yeah, check out Lance, uh, Brian, and I always forget who am Phil. I forgetting from the Horror Returns? Phil. Yeah. Phil. Uh, the Horror Returns, and leave the leave them an iTunes review. Scotty hasn't yet because he's a bad friend. Well, I but have not been able on, to get my iTunes working. Okay. Leave them a five star review because they are worth the five stars. So. And they give rad prizes. Uh, they I do. Think, yeah, uh, I think speaking of Psycho Gorman, I think the last one they gave out was a Psycho Gorman steelbook or some shit. Yeah. You mean they didn't give out the um? What was the Lance's favorite movie? Josh oh, the fan- uh, the, the fanatic. Cemetery, fanatic the remake. No. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, the Pet Cemetery remake. The Pet Cemetery well. <laughs> remake, which I also like. I don't think it's that bad. I understand you, Lance. I feel you. Um, but yeah, they're they're awesome. I want yeah. Brian to be my boyfriend, but he's married, <laughs> unfortunately. I just find him so funny. Like he's just so dry with his humor, and he's just like he's total jokes. So he totally is. <laughs> he really is. Like he's just really, really funny. Um, uh, must be funny up in Alaska. There must be not much else to do but make really good jokes. So that makes sense. <laughs> That's right? how you stay warm. That's how you stay warm, right? Uh, so the show I'm going to talk about is on the Legion Network. It's hosted by Mr. Bo Ramsdale, and it is the Hero Hero Ghost Show. And I recently listened to an episode with him and Derek B. from Cinema Attacks. Go Derek, shout out. And they talked about One Miss Call, the obviously the original version for the original movie. And man, they did a good job of talking about it. And they just know so much about Asian cinema. And for someone like me, who's really new to Asian cinema and just kind of learning kind of the tradition and the cultural values like they just nail it and they're so entertaining to listen to like Derek is a walking encyclopedia of knowledge oh he so is I love Derek Derek is one of the nicest people as well he always shares pictures of his dog with me like I get dog pics from Derek all the time and they're the best pics like he has the cutest puppies I mean they're fucking adorable but he also knows his stuff so if you're subscribing to the Legion Podcast Network which you already should be Please check out the Hero Hero Ghost Show if you're interested in learning more about Asian cinema. Yeah, that's one uh, one show on Legion that I am afraid to admit I have not had a chance to listen to. Bo's gonna so. kick you off Legion. I know. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to give in my Legion card now. Right. I, you got I a lost card. My, yeah, I lost my membership. <laughs> oh man, you get a card. <laughs> uh, but but speaking of the whole Legion thing, I'm gonna talk about uh, a podcast that is on the Legion Patreon. So. Uh, you know, intent. If you're not on Patreon, you do not get to hear this show. But uh, it is once we're. I guess we're just giving lots of love to Mr. Bo Ransdale today because this uh this show is also hosted by him, and it is the Ouija Experiment Experiment, and he it is a once a month show that he hosts that he has uh another guest from the network or someone that's just in our Legion podcast channel join him. They pick a movie with the word Ouija in the title and just it's kind of a crapshoot because there are just so many bad movies with Ouija in the title that it's pretty much uh, the him and the guest pretty much tearing apart one of these movies or looking into it actually and like you know giving it a giving it an actual shot and saying like whether it's good or bad but 99 percent of the time it's pretty bad <laughs> i know heather has been on two of the episodes uh twice i'm Bo's actually preferred guest he hasn't <laughs> ever said that i just, just assume yeah you know the ego is strong with you as well <laughs> yes because Bo and i are besties bestie Bo and i <laughs> and i've been on the show once uh been on the show as well and i've I forget who else ended up being on there, but they ended up covering Ouija Shark. So shows you the level of uh, content that they're watching for this show. And it is, it's a video style podcast as well. So it's very entertaining because Bo just has like some great ability with the uh, doing like background setups and everything. Did he do the science lab thing when you went on? He sure did. He's such a nerd. And did he refer to like science, scientific testing of the Ouija experiment? 
Yep. <laughs> so when I first did this with him, I didn't know him that well. Like now, Bo and I have obviously gotten closer just because of the stuff I've done with Legion and et cetera. I would now be like, what the fuck are you wearing? Like now I'd be like, Bo, this is ridiculous. What, what the fuck is this bullshit? Like, but then I was like, oh yeah, Bo, this is really cool. But he is a very creative person. And him and Darren are two people that can do a solo show. I know Darren yeah. doesn't because he always has the guests on, but there's some people that can rock a solo and it's the two of them. Like it's just oh. talent there, raw talent. So it's totally true. Oh, and- <laughs> we only speak the truth here, Darren. Yeah, we can't rock solo shows, Scott and I. We oh God, it would be it would be embarrassing if it was me by myself. <laughs> I mean, remember that time that Heather just gets up and left, left me to go get a switch out her coffee, and I'm just like, uh, hi. And you're like, I don't um, know what to say. I like Fireball, and <laughs> I got my new Magic cards. But I like Gremlins. <laughs> and it's like it's okay, Scott. It's okay that Heather bullies you about it. You're accepted here. <laughs> Oh, I had a friend try to teach me how to play magic and I just couldn't figure it out in high school. He's like, no, but see, I was, I was like, I, I'm glad you're having fun. I just don't get it. Yep, it's definitely it, uh, it's like I couldn't. Everyone. Yeah, that, it, it and- seemed cool, but it was. Yeah, it was like I played Hero Quest, not Dungeons and Dragons. That was like my yep, understandable. <laughs> see, Darren was secretly span. like, aren't you mad about the political shit that's going on in our school? <laughs> like, <laughs> So guys, while we're talking about this, do you realize the inequality that's being pushed upon us in our classrooms? I would have loved to go right to high there. school with Darren. I would have totally hung out with Darren, so I would be cooler. Like, for <laughs> sure. I would have been yeah. like, this guy's hang the out, shit. Hang out in the basement with me and the other skater kids. That's right. I would have. I would have tried to hit on all your friends, too. Like, for real. Right? I probably would have hit I on had some very handsome like, friends. Like, you know, I've been like hitting on all of you, just like throwing it all out there. See where it sticks. That's still my life, just so we're clear. <laughs> That's still what I do. Nothing's changed. What did we say? I was during the prom episode, I was telling Scott about me grinding on a boyfriend so much that the teachers told us to leave room for the Holy Spirit. And Scott's like, So I see nothing's changed. I'm like, Yeah, no, like for real, like 20 <laughs> years later. It's all the same shit. That's why we love you. It's true. I had the best compliment was given to me is that I was that I'm real and authentic. And I'm like, well, I guess I am like, it's yeah, you, you know? absolutely are. <laughs> yeah, I don't make any bones about it. I'm like, this is it. Either you like it or, or you feel don't. ashamed about something. There's not not to be ashamed about. Exactly. Right. Right. Exactly. Thank you, Darren. <laughs> Darren. Vindicated. Uh, <laughs> vindicated. <laughs> so thank you, everyone, for listening to our show so far. We're going to take a brief break and listen to one of our Legion friends. I'm sure Scott's going to probably choose one of Darren's podcasts to promo in between. More Maybe likely. You could do both. You could do both. Yeah, I could. Promo Vanessa as well. Yeah, and her voice is on the VD Clinic one. Okay, who does the intro for the VD Clinic? Is that Vanessa? the the voiceover yeah not not the song the song is some vd psa that she found way before me but yeah that she does the the sultry narration no way yeah that is the sexiest fucking voice i've ever heard (laughs) (laughs) like for realsies for realsies (laughs) yeah that that is her wow vanessa's so cool (laughs) next level connection the budding cismance Man, between you ladies like, and the other, yeah. well, we get along really well we did that episode with you and like our views are completely the same so when eventually <laughs> vanessa and i do our little short series it's just going to be us being mad about the same shit for like an hour it's going to be great and, yeah it's going to be awesome right? and i'll just be so angry, listening to it right after these messages we'll be right back Ooh, double down are you sick of the same old stale podcast oh, Well, then join Vanessa and Darren as they dissect movies of all kinds. The two lifelong cinema lovers bring their favorites, curiosities, and first-time watches to the operating table and inject them with a healthy dose of snark. Then there's the waiting room, where they examine books and short stories. So just look for them on Apple Podcasts and where fine podcasts are available. They're part of the Legion Podcast Network. Follow them on Twitter at VD Clinic Pod. 
Join them on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash VD Clinic Pod or email them at VD Clinic Pod at gmail.com. They're ready to cure what ails you. <laughs> and still, they just might be a little contagious. This is a test of the emergency podcasting system. Listen to the Psychosemantic Podcast. Politics, movies, and political movies. Find us on Facebook, iTunes, Stitcher, legionpodcasts.com, the Psychosemantic Podcast. And welcome back. I hope you liked listening to Darren's shows. Uh, you can go back and listen to those when you're done listening to this one and see what better shows sound like. Uh, but <laughs> today, uh, because Darren is on, we are going to be talking about politics and horror. And I was, I really wanted to go with the low hanging fruit known as the purge, but we did not go with low hanging fruit. We actually pulled from some other awesome movies today. Two were a first time watch for me. Uh, one is a beloved watch for me. And uh, one of those first time watches turned into one of my favorite films. But we're going to give a little article about horror and politics. And now I know a lot of people will say things like, well, I don't like talk about politics with my horror. And all media is involved in politics to some level. And the horror genre is no different. So there is an article that I will read from that you can find at Horror Geek Life. And it's by Stephen oh, Rosenberg. I used to write for them. But it's not by Scott Crawford. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to read one of Scott's Crawford. What did you write for, Under Gaming? Yeah, but it was video game articles. Oh, look at you, huh? <laughs> the smoke show knows no bounds. Uh, and this is back from November 3rd, 2020. He starts off with, I know, election. I know, it's oh, wow. election day. So it was election day, November 3rd, right? Yep, I, sound, I, I think that was the date. It's always that the was first day Tuesday in November. That Darren so. didn't sleep. Yeah. Oh, I didn't sleep for about that month. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and by this point, the only thing you want to escape from is the droning existence dread of a future in which your candidate loses. I'm not here to tell you which way to vote, so at ease, soldier. I'm here to point out that especially over the last few years, a talking point I've heard come up countless times is to keep, palace, keep politics the blank out of it. Be it professional sports, the acting industry, food labels, video games, that response to be, seems to be the immediate go-to, as if politics have no place in our lives aside from directly in our own existence. As if the people involved with these things have no right to believe what they believe or decide what they decide. I'm passionate about film, extremely passionate. So when I hear keep politics out of horror movies, the rebuttal to a new released horror film, I want to throw my hands in the air and scream to the world, why, when haven't they been in horror? Horror is politics, politics are horror, and they've always been. Maybe we just haven't been listening. I don't want to go back too far, so let's start with some relevant horror films from the 70s. In fact, this would even be a political horror article if I didn't start with Mary, a Mayor Larry Vaughn from Steven Spielberg's Jaws. Wasn't he used all the time for memes? Oh, he was. was opening up. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I know we all like to joke about someone being the mayor from Jaws, and I think the reason for it is that one of the most glaring examples of political corruptions in films, or it is one of the most glaring examples of political corruption in film. You have an elected official that is so afraid to put his political career in, dan in danger that the proven death of his constituents pale in comparison to his re-election focus. Even after the mayor sees people killed with his own eyes, one of his first reaction is they can save August. God, this sounds familiar. Meaning <laughs> that if they deal with the shark problem now, the tourists will come back and save his ass. Spoiler alert, he's the same mayor in Jaws too. <laughs> A classic case of taking all the glory and none of the blame. Let's look at another founding father when it comes to political horror. George A. Romano's Night of the Living Dead. At the time in America where Black people were basically only used as villains and sidekicks, 
Dwayne, is it Dwayne Jones? Did I say that right? You guys mm-hmm. know? Yeah. I believe yes. so, yeah. Yeah, took on the first major Black lead horror role. The entire film, he takes charge so he can lead, protect, and defend. He's one of the only characters to get through a terrifying night of zombie attacks, only to be killed upon the police, killed by the police upon their arrival, showing that a Black man in America can survive an Asabi outbreak but can't survive their own country. And the police would rather shoot first and ask questions later. Now, we all know that this wasn't done purposely, but the fact that it was done at all, and I think that's what people fail to understand, we still have racial and sexual sex divides when it comes to people getting into powerful roles, lead roles, etc. So in 1952, for George A. Romano to even be like, well, he was the best fit. I didn't really think about his skin color. That's fine if that wasn't that was his intent. But the impact of it is what we're talking about here. Yep. The impact of having a black man tell a white man what to do in 1952 was huge. Yes, absolutely. Right. Um, so George A. Romano. So sorry, I talked about that one. Where are we? Romano had also previously done The Crazies, 1973, which showed the government torched their mistakes, their people, and covered up any wrongdoing, a theme that will be used over and over again in horror in the next few decades. Return of the Living Dead, The Belco Experiment. Alien versus Predators 2. Even West Craven's The Hill ha- Hills Have Eyes from 1977 shows the government turning their back on locals that were affected by nuclear testing. I'm not sure if there's really a better display of political horror than David Cronenberg, Scott's best friend. But- Although The Dead Zone in 1983 was written by Stephen King, Cronenberg really hammered home the importance of stopping politically corrupt individuals from climbing into positions of ultimate power. It doesn't get much sleazier and dangerous than Greg Stilson, a career politician that would go on to unleash nuclear attacks around the world after interpreting a dream as a message from God. I think it's worth mentioning how involved with political horror Stephen King has been through his career as well. See The Stand, The Green Mile, The Long Walk, The Running Man, etc., etc. Cronenberg would go on to focus on the dangers of consumerism in Videodrome and the corruption and power in The Fly. And let's not forget the government trying to use telekinetic powers in Cronenberg's scanners and King's fire starter in 1984. I think the focus top-down consumerism is better highlighted in John Carpenter's They Live, which represents how controlled we are by the rich and powerful people in charge. We're going to be getting into that certainly, actually, with one of our films. Mm -hmm. They control the media, which controls us, and the only way to stop it is to rise up and take a stand against it. I think about this film every time I see a political advertisement on TV or really enter at any advertisement. Don't sleep on the stuff either from 1985. Nope. That was another one that I almost picked for our show too. Right. The eighties just weren't about politically based horror movies, but the politics blended into the film creations themselves. Actors like Mark Patton and Anthony Perkins were blacklisted in films because of their HIV diagnosis, as well as civil unrest created by politicians Films like Nightmare on Elm Street, Freddy's Revenge was created as an insult to the LGBTQ uh, plus community rather than a celebration of it. By the way, which screen, by the way, watch Scream Queen on Shudder. I would agree 100%. Yep. And I point to that. I think people have criticized Mark Patton in that film, uh, the documentary, for being too upset. You know, I don't know how I would feel as a gay man in the 1980s and 90s trying to come out. So I'm not going to judge how he felt because that's not me living that life. (laughs) Absolutely not. Um, In the early 90s, with more civil unrest, came more radical political horror. Candyman 1992 may look like a typical slasher on the outside. But the black the backstory of a black man tortured for simply falling in love with a light woman and turn the other way mentality the police and the city have on the serial murdering of black people in low income areas are focused here. Tales from the Hood shares the black perspective of police brutality, domestic abuse, corrupt politicians and racism in the prison system. And wow, that fucking movie. Yeah, <laughs> Um, I'm sure Darren's listened to our episode where I talked about that, how I thought it was a light film. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a light film, <laughs> as I found out. Darren, you've seen it, I assume. Oh, Tales from the Hood? Yes. 
Yes, uh, many a time. Um, did you did you know what it was going into it, or did you think it was going to be light and fluffy like me? Uh, no, I had a pretty good expectation just from looking at. Uh, well, I yeah, I, I forget exactly why, but I had just sort of looked into it a little bit, and uh, the, the actors who directed that. Uh, I can't remember. Yeah, I can't um, think of off the top of my head. Like I know they've done the last two as well. Yeah, the second one was not as good. No, and I haven't. I haven't seen the third one. Third one is definitely um, better than part two. Okay, but yeah, when I saw Spike Lee was involved, and um, oh, and it's directed by Rusty Cundiff. Yeah, and Clarence Williams the uh, third. Yes, he's usually he usually lends himself to at least something. I, when I think of Clarence William the third, I think of Tales from the Hood and his character in I'm Gonna Get You Sucker. Yes, yeah, and I'll uh, say so since we just kind of brought him up, rest in peace, Clarence Williams. He yeah. just yeah. passed away yeah. this week. Just passed he did away. just pass away. So obviously it talks like about the 90s and 80s, but then we jump up to later years. So of course, political horror isn't some 30-year-old idea. Take the Purge series, for example, which seemed to start out as a home invasion style film and has evolved into a social commentary that the government hates poor people to the point of purging them out of society. Look at films like Jordan Peele's Get Out with the message that black people are only seen as physical specimens to be exploited or us which expresses the metaphor that the Black community are government-oppressed underground dwellers tethered to those with privilege. Wow, that's so fucking true. Mm -hmm. uh, spiral 2020, which is the Canadian spiral, not the most recent spiral, focuses on the idea that a gay interracial couple doesn't belong in the suburbs. The idea isn't strictly American either. Um, bone, bone Joan Ho just won an Oscar for presenting the society oppression of poor people by the rich and powerful and parasite class I oppression. Still Sorry? Need to see, I still need to see that movie. I need to see it too. Darren's Ooh. definitely seen it. You've not seen it? No. No. Oh, oh it's my. One that it's been on my list that I really need to get to. Darren's going to get off the show right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, He's like, we're all no, going to go I'm watch gonna... it and then we're going to come back because we can't move That's... forward. We'll do that for another episode. You guys can come on and talk about it on Psycho Semantic with me or something like that. That would be oh, awesome. Perfect. Awesome. Um, class oppression in was a theme in Snowpiercer, which Darren has covered on his show with Lance, as well, where the poor class was kept to the back of the train, where the promises of trickle-down perks would fall in exhausted ears until an uprising was a uprising occurred. One of the most recent powerful films showing political corruptions is Shutter's La Lorna which follows the haunting of a powerful world criminal that got away with his crimes. Hmm. It's not just saying that I agree with every film that has political commentary, but I do believe that filmmaking is an art. And like Son writing, painting art is subjective to the artist's feelings and experience. They deserve the opportunity and the respect to share the art and the opinion, just like we all do in every days of our lives. And I feel like this really goes for Lucky. I get very frustrated when people tell me that Lucky was mansplaining domestic abuse to them. Wow, it has never... to be it has to be mansplained because here's the reality: we don't always believe that it happens. You may, as an individual, know that it happens, and that's great. You may be well informed. You may understand that women, especially women of color or indigenous, are are one in three. I think the stat is could be sexually assaulted or will be sexually assaulted in their lifetime. And that's in developed countries like Canada and the United States. We're not even looking at under underdeveloped countries or what we consider underdeveloped countries, but not everybody does. So that's why some artists will take that perspective that they need to share this message and be forceful with it because they feel like not everybody is getting it. You may be getting it, but other people may not be getting it. And I think that's sometimes tough for us um, because especially if we feel like a message is overused and we become exhausted by it or maybe it's draining for us or maybe we feel guilty or maybe it's just you know we don't want to continuously see it because it's upsetting and we don't want to think that that happens I know I have that with one of the movies we watched it was very hard for me to get through because it was upsetting uh it, mm -hmm. it bothered me because I had seen those things happen and I don't always like to know that they do and that's okay but an artist is allowed to express that and allowed to express it for the masses and for people who may not understand that specific perspective, because we all come from different perspectives. Um, the article, this article isn't meant to rile anyone up, nor is our podcast about it. 
Um, that's my own add-in that I'm giving there. <laughs> it's just to simply say that maybe politics have always been been part of things so we can desperately claim we want them go desperately claim we want them gone from. And maybe these things don't ever exist without politics. Maybe we need to take a closer look and maybe we can change them in the future by changing our politics. Like I said at the beginning of the article, I'm not going to tell you how to vote, but I'm going to tell you to vote. Vote in your local, state, national, provincial, municipal, or Canada-wide election. <laughs> and the only way we can make positive changes for everyone if we acknowledge that we've made mistakes throughout history and work together to learn from them. Everyone should feel like they have a government that cares about them, so let's make that happen very warm and fuzzy ending to the article. But it's definitely, I like the point about artists being able to express their voice and their opinion. And you can see this through paintings, you can see this through songwriting. I'm a big Van Morrison fan, and he's recently come out with a, a lot of anti-lockdown songs. And whether I agree with him or not, he has an avenue in order to present that opinion. He doesn't believe in the lockdown, he thinks that's causing more harm than good. I, at the same time, can accept a lucky film coming out talking about the severity of female abuse. Yep. So I think that you have to be, on both sides, willing to let somebody speak their opinion, as long as it's not presenting hate. And when you're talking about domestic abuse of any kind, whether it's male on male, female on female, transgendered, whatever the case may be, any kind of abuse is wrong. Opinions on lockdowns, I can understand, can differ. That is a little bit of a different topic than abuse. So yeah. I think it's also understanding where pin opinions differing do not impact somebody's safety, though I guess you could argue that with lockdowns too, but I don't put it in the same category that I would put in abuse. But I guess we'll get into our movies. I think that article was a good tie-in. What do you guys think? Yeah, I yeah. think it did great. You know, yeah, like like they said, with uh, Romero using Dwayne Jones in the 60s, choosing the be best man for the job and people like people thinking that it was a political move. Like you said, the act of doing it is the point. Best person for the job. And I mean, what James Whale was working through some of his stuff, being a closeted homosexual in Frankenstein, whenever the fuck that came out in the 30s. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's. If you live in the world, politics affect your life. And yeah, I think that was a, a really good tie-in and um, good good find. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Darren. I tried to impress you. Uh, <laughs> legit. So, Scott, why don't you bring us in with our first film? <laughs> oh, boy. All right. So the first film we are going to be talking about is Society, released March 3rd, 1990. A very short synopsis here, but a Beverly Hills teen discovers his parents are part of a gruesome orgy cult of the social elite. Uh, yeah, this is one that I wanted to bring to the table just for the fact that I knew Heather had not seen it. And I knew this would be a good one topic of discussion because this is literally a discussion of the rich eating the poor in like most basic terms and using them for their own status. Um but yeah, this is uh, one that I watched a few years ago, and I didn't know what the hell I was getting into. And then as this film unfolded, I am just like disgusted at, at the same time, completely fascinated and intrigued by the story. And it's directed by Brian Usna, so like it does not surprise me because that guy does some really good films. Um, but yeah, I guess we'll uh, hand this off over to our guest. Darren, wh what are your thoughts on this film? Uh, I am a big fan of this this film, uh, like you said, it's, uh, well, uh, uh, man, I don't even know where to start. I, I haven't seen this in a couple years, so bringing back up the summer series. This was in uh, one of my years for that, I believe, or it made the last, the final year countdown. Now is the last time I had seen it. It is very Cronenbergian. I, I would say uh, the the practical the the effects by oh shit who was that uh, screaming mad George I don't know if you're familiar with well you are familiar with their work but I don't know oh if, yeah I mean Big Trouble in Little China Nightmare on Elm Street three and four I think yep Brighter uh, Reanimator right yeah Freaked uh, I'm a big fan of the Freaked movie from uh, the early 90s with Alex Winter from Bill and Ted I don't know and oh I've, I've not seen, seen that, one. that. Oh man. Um and plenty of other things and yeah it is just one of those 1980s there's going to be a 
uh, especially coming, you know, coming from the eighties, this came out, what you said, 19, if it was 1990, so it was made in the eighties, technically. Yeah. It was made in the eighties. A lot of commentary about class and, uh, the wealth gap. Uh, a couple of our movies are going to talk about that, but yeah. Uh, I don't know how far I'm supposed to go into it in this introductory part. <laughs> uh, just, uh, just to uh, say one of your basic thoughts, and I'll say because I, I was kind of curious to see what you thought about this. I was, and, I was glad sorry. somebody picked it because I might have picked it if it hadn't have been picked. Nice. So, what do we think the main political themes are uh, that are at play here? Obviously, there's the kind of I would say the major, which is the rich consuming consuming the poor, feeding off the poor. Uh, I felt like there was some sexual stuff in here too, that the coming out party. Yeah. Oh yes. I was party. not familiar with coming out parties till this film. It's, I feel like it's a little bit more Southern debutante sort of culture, which also feeds into the whole, what is it? Egalitarian. Is that the right word? I think that's the or, right word to use. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's very old and traditional and, old ways it feeds into the i don't even how what the the people it's not very clear in the film and it's a little less clear from the original version in the script but yeah it is it is like the wealthy and the upper class and the elite are almost different species and yeah yeah what I didn't get, so Billy, throughout the time working with his therapist, he states that he feels like he's adopted, like he doesn't quite fit in with the family, which is why I'm assuming he doesn't have a coming out party, because it seems like a coming out party, oh, the judge will be there, it's this very, like, elaborate, she has to wear a specific dress, like, it's very, like, sexist, and you dance with the boys and all this other shit. Um, Billy didn't have a coming out party, that was my understanding, right? No, no, pick it's generally for the girls. And I don't know if okay. back in the day it was like, here she is, what old friend of mine is going to marry her and take her yeah. off my hands sort of yes. thing. Yes, yes. To keep the sense. rich bloodline going, basically. Right, yeah. well, ownership of women, right? Like if a yeah. woman was owned by her fa her father and then given to a man, right? Which is very, you know, what happened, right? So I found that really interesting. And then the 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 orgy that sounded out being sounded there and being sexual and then turned murderous as like shunting. kind of a setup yeah the shunting <laughs> yeah i thought it was a really interesting setup like i felt like this was trying to be com like comical at points but also oh. very serious to the class gap and i believe there was a recession during the 80s in america was there not yes yep right yeah. Reaganomics, yeah, cutting cutting taxes on the wealthy uh, didn't work out that well for the economy. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> A shock faint on that one, right? Yeah. But I did find that interesting in how he's working with this doctor who keeps trying to want to provide him medicine, and no one's really believing him of what's going on and then there's the one female character that i guess becomes attracted to him and they have that very vivid sex scene yeah and where he and he, like, this whole entire time he's also seen like these weird images like that he's not right. sure if he's actually seen or not like with her and the sex scene like they're like oh yeah the rich clarissa, in this, right yeah clarissa yes clarissa yeah and the rich in this tend to get a little sweaty and uh like in, in a very gross way especially towards the end but like in the sex scene like you know she's protruding a lot of sweat and then also just like the malformed shape of her body when he looks back at her one time and looks back again and she's back to normal but like yeah i think it's uh her it's like she was just like part of this quote-unquote alien race that fell in love almost like a romeo and juliet story where it's like she's fallen in love with him and doesn't want him to be part of the shunting I feel like she can, tries to control him at first. Like, she's like, I'm better than you. Like, the whole rich class, right, to the lower class kind of thing. Uh, even when he shows up at that party and he makes a scene with Ted, who's supposed to be the, like, the rich guy in school or, like, the most popular guy and his girlfriend's, like, Billy's girlfriend's super upset that they haven't been invited to this party. Like, I felt like it did talk a lot about caste system. And then the consumption piece. I guess I'm kind of jumping ahead because I feel like, everything leads up to the consuming and yes. obviously a lot of money went into the special effects behind this too there's a oh, whole yeah. like drawn out of, of people morphing very cronenbergish 
uh, made my stomach turn dramatically. <laughs> I'll be honest. Midway it's really through, really gross. <laughs> and I, I sat through fucking solo, and I was like, "This is like different than solo, obviously." But it was kind of, it was kind of gross. Like it got yeah. gross for me. Uh, and I just got that it was, we're better than you. We will consume everything, take the lifeblood out of it so we can be successful, which is what capitalism is, you know, based upon is this concept that we can all get to that higher level, but we, we can't. It's not shaped up for that. That's not the, the business model behind capitalism. Is there something more that I'm not getting from this? Or is that what it was? Because I feel like that that really gruesome long consumption scene and then Carissa living with Billy and Billy escaping was just basically about the rich. Like it was like, this is what the rich are doing. Or is there something else that I missed? Um, from what I've gathered, it's mainly, yeah, just like um, keeping the, the rich bloodline solid and continuing it. Because obviously like the whole coming out party with... Uh, I forget his sister's name, but like passing her on to Ted and Jenny. I think. Yes, Jenny. Yep. And then passing her on to Ted and then, you know, also keeping her within the family with uh, the mother and father. And, you know, Billy was, we find out, adopted and was basically being bred for this whole shunting thing. And uh, but yeah, I think it is just pretty much the whole consumption of the poor and living off of what the poor have done. Or the well, I shouldn't say the poor, but the middle class and lower class. Yeah, yeah. Anything you want to add, Darren, that we're missing? No, I feel like that's pretty. It's it's kind of out there, right in front with what it's trying to say. I mean, somebody says the rich have always sucked off low class shit like you. Uh, we're like a different breed. Everything's getting together to they they do a lot of eugenics talk, which you would find especially in the older upper class uh coming out party sort of southern tradition or whatever this this came from and it's it's satire on purpose so it kind of is upfront and obvious about it because the ludicrous the i mean uh, the the shunting scene is partially inspired by uh Salvador Dali painting speaking of probably oh, really? yeah yeah and uh, yeah, I, I think they they backed a little bit away from just being like, well, they're aliens, which isn't, I mean, they, I think they say, actually say they're not aliens, but I think th- th- talking about how, yeah, I, I, I think it's it's pretty obvious with what it's trying to say. And I think Yasna didn't shy away from that. Uh, he likes to... Yeah. Just be like, yeah, it's what I'm fucking saying, you know, sort of, <laughs> right? Sort of thing. And I was just reading some notes here, and it did very well in Europe. It didn't do so well in the United States. It huh. wasn't received Shocking. well. <laughs> and I wonder if it's because, and and this is jumping into another side note. I I used to really enjoy the show Shark Tank more because I like hearing what people have innovated. But the line that I absolutely fucking hate is American dream. I equally hate the line Canadian dream because I think for majority of people, it is unattainable expectations because Mm -hmm. of the capitalist system set up. And I have benefited from capitalism very much so. I am a white, cis, middle-class woman, okay? Like I am straight, I am boring as white bread. I am... And I have a middle-class income. I was raised in middle-class income. So I benefited from it. And I'm not going to pretend like I have, because I have. But I just feel like sometimes we're in denial that there's a structure like this, because maybe that takes away from the fantasy that one day we could be part of the society. Temporarily inconvenienced millionaires. Yeah, what is it? the, uh, The carrot on the stick, if you will? And I feel like this movie showed how, you know, people wanted to be part of the society. The society had these beautiful parties. They had nice cars. They had this, they had that. But it's, you couldn't become part of the society unless you were part of that specific breed. Like it's Mm -hmm. it's an in-kept situation. And I just wonder if it didn't do well in the United States because we still want to keep envisioning that one day we will be part of that society and people weren't ready to hear this message. I don't know. I mean, it's a good possibility. It's kind of hard to tell. Cause this is like one of those, like, cause I don't think this made it to theaters. I think this was like a straight to VHS thing. Mm. And so true who knows like, I mean, how horror thrived in the VHS era, like straight to VHS era because of their cover art. And, but yeah, it makes me wonder if like, 
this just was uh, not understood at the time, maybe even. Yeah, and they do have on their cover from the producer of Reanimator. So, yeah. you know, I think that kind of would help for their marketing, though. I would argue that this and Reanimator are different films, personally. Oh, absolutely different. Right? So I think that, I just think it's interesting. I was really, you know, from a special effects part, this movie was incredible. Like, what they did in 1989 was pretty fucking good. The melding together, the, you know, almost looking like anteaters at some point, <laughs> yep. like their faces. <laughs> Uh, and of course, like the political social message of it, I just find it really interesting that it wasn't even released in theaters. I think that says all I need to know about how ready we were to hear mm-hmm. that message. And it would be interesting if this message, if this movie was remade today, I can guarantee there would be more of an interest in it. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. And so it would be a theatrical release. Absolutely. Right. So maybe this is a movie that is due for a remake and they may take away some of the comedy and may make it a little bit more serious because it is a satire, right? Like it does have comedy into it. Like the blow up doll for fucking sakes is in like the Jeep and gets passed around (laughs) and like other silly shit like that, which is meant to be funny, right? Like it's meant to kind of give a release and I'd be interested if they took a real serious tone with a remake of this. Yeah, I'd be very curious to see what they would do with it. Right, if they did choose to do that. It is, you know, what we're looking at over 30 years. Yeah. Right, the world has changed a lot politically. So if we're not, if we're done, we can move to the next one. Disparity has grown. Sorry, what was that, Darren? Well, and wealth disparity has done nothing but grow. Yeah. Yes. The gap is even further apart now. Excellent point, right? And and it's more, and I think after COVID too, and the pandemic that we've all faced as a world, we're going to see it more and more, the, the difference, right? Oh, yeah. We've already started seeing that. Yeah, unfortunately, right? So I guess we'll move to the next one, if everyone's ready. All right. Yeah, so the next film that uh, we're going to talk about is People Under the Stairs, released November 1st, 1991, directed by one Wes Craven. Two adults and a juvenile break into a house occupied by a brother and sister and their stolen children. There they must fight for their lives. Uh, this is another one that kind of ties in with the uh, the rich feeding off the poor in a way with uh, the whole society, because uh, this one is basically about this, like I said, the brother and sister living in this uh, old funeral parlor home that has been buying out properties left and right around the, uh, I would say, the urban cities or the urban town that they're in and forcing people out of their homes and forcing them to live in lower income style housing and basically keeping the poor poor while they are getting richer. And then these two, uh, this one guy and uh, this son decide that they are going to, not a son, but one guy and this kid decide they're going to break into their home and steal from the rich to help the help the poor out basically. And uh, well, they find some more fucked up degenerative style secrets inside this house. Mm-hmm. Uh, Darren, what are your thoughts? I am a big fan of this movie. I am a big Wes Craven fan. There he and... is. You're on the right podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Ohio boy represent uh, he's <laughs> he's from up around Cleveland and yeah I mean this this movie I think I first saw it when I was 10 or 11 or something like that uh, it was one of those movies that my older sister rented for a sleepover and I would watch the movies the day after all the girls leave because I wasn't allowed you know <laughs> right <laughs> during the time but yeah I mean this movie and Wes Craven being Wes Craven he's very out in the open about messaging in his movies he's uh directly said that this was a commentary on uh bush senior's america and oh interesting uh you know george bush senior the whole wealth disparity that was growing go go from society to now or to then the whole uh and putting on different faces you know two sides of a different house there's what you see from the outside and what's actually going on inside And like Wes Craven, he got part of the idea from a newspaper article. And it was about like you would see, and speaking of Cleveland, I mean, it it happened, uh, you know, maybe it happens too often, but there's this house that nobody suspects anything. And then all of a sudden you find out that there's children living in the wall that the parents never let outside. And they, like he did, he read an article about, yeah, this unassuming family or husband and wife, and then 
somebody saw a burglar go into the house. So they called the cops. Nobody found the burglars, but they found a little boy and a little girl that had their own made up language and they'd never been outside. Wow. And, um, and then he had a dream. Wes Craven. He had a dream about part of this movie and then he wrote the idea down that he had another dream and he got more details. And I mean, yeah, Leroy uh, Ving Rhames and uh, his like girlfriend's little brother, I guess, is what fool is. Yeah, that's kind of what I would his call his girlfriend's. Yeah, his girlfriend's little brother. Uh, their mom is sick. It's America, so you've got to rob a house to pay for cancer surgery, cancer mm-hmm. treatment. Yeah, this yeah. movie couldn't be made in Canada. They just <laughs> no. go to the hospital. Yeah. It's like Breaking Bad Canada version. I have cancer. Yeah. Okay, the end. <laughs> Yeah, the end. Okay, <laughs> you go and get treated. The end. <laughs> I am the one with socialized medicine. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I mean, yeah, and the and we're gonna get into this uh, probably some uh, in other places, but uh, like the religious hypocrisy of mommy and daddy, the twisted brother sister from Twin Peaks uh, that, right? They, they played a married couple in Twin Peaks, didn't they? I think they did. Yes. Um, and just the child abuse and things that are, people doing worse things because somebody did something that they think is bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, how about you, Heather? So I've seen this movie many a times and there's some obvious like political themes to it, right? There's some obvious of gentrification of, you know, oppression of people from lower income, specifically people that are African-American. I wish they would explore the healthcare thing a little bit more. I feel like few movies besides Michael Moore films really dig into that. And I would like to see a horror film that goes into that a little bit more. There was one with Denzel Washington years ago where his son needs a heart transplant and he doesn't have the insurance to cover it. And he eventually goes into a hospital and he has like, uh, he, I don't want to say robs the hospital, but he takes them hostage. You guys ever see that film? No, I he demands a heart exactly transplant. For, talking about. Yeah. And he yeah. demands a heart transplant i feel like that movie challenged it but didn't go all the way and i feel like what what wes craven did here that society couldn't do was he presented this in a fun little adventure story he he presented issues with poverty a little bit of racism um child abuse in a fun feel good story where people make it out at the end to give you an idea, this film was number one at the box office when it came out for five weeks, yeah. where society didn't even get a theatrical release. <laughs> and we're looking at a movie that came out within a year of each other with similar messages. But it's the packaging. The yep. packaging makes a difference, right? So I throw in you know, a cute little boy named Fool with a little girl who's very sweet. And, you know, these two pieces of shit that are incest, who already were like, incest, oh, gross, gross, yuck, yuck, yuck. <laughs> And they're assholes. And we're like, oh, and they're assholes too, right? Like you're getting angry and anger at them because they're easy to hate instead of, you know, people that have a lifestyle that you wish you had and that you've been told if you just work hard enough, you'll get it. Yeah. Right. So I think that that's interesting is that these movies had very different mess, like similar messages, but were just packaged differently. I've always found the bathtub scene in this film very hard to watch. It really upsets me partly because that shit is happens and child abuse in general is very hard for me to observe in films um you know and not like trying to be like oh it's hard for me and if it's not hard for someone else like i just that shit happens like Wes craven always takes a fraction of something that he's experienced and you know kids are thrown in the scolding hot bath water because they didn't do or say what they were supposed to and i could see people taking children and cutting out their tongues and doing shit like that. And I always found that part of the movie the hardest message for me to handle. Yeah, especially the whole fact that, you know, all that torture and then the, also the cutting off of the kids' ears and mm-hmm. like they're being locked in a freaking cell underneath the stairs, hence the people under the stairs, and being fed like human flesh and just whatever scraps these fucked up psychos decide to give them. And it's just like all because, uh, I'm not like I wasn't sure if these were just like people that have ever broken into the house before or people they decided just to randomly kidnap. Like I don't remember I don't think that was ever made clear. Like what do you mean? Like, oh, they 
they killed like water meter reader people and shit which how would the company not follow up on that like i'm sorry right like that there was like there was some but that's not the main part of the movie that's more of a review piece but like if i sent someone out as a company out a meter reader and they never came back i would probably be looking into that like especially if it happened in a specific neighborhood just saying um, my beef with this movie, and I think that it excludes capitalism very well, but I think it, and maybe because it also came out in 1991, it skated over other issues that could have gone deeper. So if that, for example, Fool wants to be a doctor. Yeah. Now we know how difficult it is. I work in a post-secondary institution. I can tell you how difficult it is for kids who don't come from privilege to become a doctor. Oh yeah. It's fucking hard for multiple reasons, you know, coming back to resources, educational access, blah, 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 blah. I wish they had examined that a little bit more. You know, like I felt like he's like, I want to be a doctor. And the guy's like, you'll never be a doctor. Ha ha. I'm like, I would have loved to see maybe more of like, you know, fool getting down to being like, I'm going to take my studies really seriously. And, you know, this has taught me that I really like, it doesn't have to be like a speech or anything, but I just, I, I found that line was thrown in there and then nothing was done with it in that social issue. And yeah, maybe because well, it was 1991. Right. I mean, I mean, kind of, like Leroy did kind of say when he let, like kind of mock fool, like he did say like, yeah, not like we're basically like what he said was we're too, you're too poor to even become a doctor. Like, yeah. So like it, that kind of hints at it, but yeah, it could have been uh, gone into it a lot more. Like personally for me, it doesn't make it a bad movie. I got yeah. also accept that it's 1991 and you're not going to go into that. You're, you're more or less focusing on the fact like we're tearing down these poor housing, shitty buildings that aren't maintained anyway, which happens to this day. I used to work in employment services and community counseling. And I had uh, newcomers to Canada that lived in buildings that, that were fed with fucking rats. So, you know, that happens now. And, you know, I think that's great that they, you know, address that. So I understand like there were bigger issues. There's just little things that I, yet again, oh, yeah. if a remake happened now, I would be interested to see how they explored other issues. Yeah. Like that makes me wonder if they would explore more of the inner city stuff that yeah. they're hinting at and like a lot like, more, and more of the, of the inner city issues. racism and, yeah. and like classism and stuff. But I think Phil for 1991, it was pretty good. Darren, did you want to add something about how you felt they explored the issues? Did you think they were explored well? Oh, well, you know, I, I will, <laughs> I love a heavy handed political movie, so I'm always fine for more. I, I think it could have been gone into uh, a little bit further, like you said, discussing the why. I mean, a lot of crime, especially a lot of crime like robbery, is necessity, not out of joy. And yeah. it, it could have discussed a little bit. And they do talk a little bit about how, I mean, just just a little bit of what creepy incest couple were living above like dragons was enough to change fool's life yeah pretty much forever yeah yeah and uh <laughs> it, it would have been interesting to see what happened because you know at, at the end spoiler alert you see a lot of this people under the stairs just sort of wandering away yeah you know i i, I always kind of wondered what happened with that oh i was like so uh, they're just gonna chill in society now like with their like <laughs> saber tooth teeth and like no ears you know. okay they're, but it's a, it's a 1991 yeah. ending, right? So yeah, you know there there was no actually. Does this movie this movie doesn't have a theme song? No, the I don't think it I does. thought it did. Uh, but yeah, but traditional late 80s, early 90s, there would be a rap song at the end that tells the story of the movie. Yep. And that didn't happen, but it's not like Wes Craven did that typically. But yeah, I, I feel like he's still exploring his his messaging uh, you know, that you see throughout his good and bad films. There's always that social message. And that's I mean, that's part of his life. I mean, he grew up in uh, oppressive religion. I don't think mm. I think he said that he didn't see a movie until he was in college or some shit. Oh, wow. wow. Um or at least regularly didn't see movies like TV and movies wasn't a thing in his house. And you know, he went to a religious college. He got in trouble as the editor of the school newspaper for allowing an article to be printed that supported interracial dating or something like that. And so he's always been bumping up against shittiness in society. And it was, it was really cool to see that. And it's kind of fun to go back and visit it because I feel like when I was a kid, I didn't think about all of these issues in the movie. Yeah. Nope. I, I didn't just even remember, catch them. Yeah. Scary dude in his leather daddy outfit. Yeah. And chewing on bodies in the basement. Yeah. Yeah. 
I remember the child abuse thing was always something that bothered me that someone would hurt kids like that. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and I think that's definitely a theme that plays out the belt beating or the indicated belt beating that's about to occur is very hard to watch. And I, I did appreciate the part where the cops come and she has this tea set up and they're like, oh, you know, we had this report of child abuse and how it's basically disregarded because of how they present themselves. And I think that's very much uh, a reality. I've always had this fantasy of making a horror film and it's a little bit based off of who I am as a person, but being the villain. So you have a white middle-class woman educated and she's trying to solve a crime. There's all these murders that are happening of kids in the in the community. And she thinks she figures out what's going on. And it leads it on till eventually you find out it's her. And she's able to get away with it because she's a white middle class woman. And it's like that twist at the end because you don't suspect nice. that person, right? Yeah, it it does come in. It does come into it. Uh, I was speaking of of that that angle. Um, like uh, I think this was off the show, but on my shows before, I've talked about how my wife is a social worker, and she used to work at Head Start, which I don't know if you know what Head oh, Start yeah. is, Heather. But no, I don't. yeah, Scott, you do. It's it's like um, income assistance, uh, early childhood, preschool education type stuff. I believe it's the the policy was if you were fifteen minutes late picking up your child you they were supposed to call child protective services but the other day we were about a half hour late picking up our son from school that he goes to aftercare so it's a lot of wiggle room yep they just called us yep and said hey uh just making sure that somebody's coming to pick him up it's like yeah yeah it's they treat systems treat people differently and it's pretty obvious how you dress how you look And the 15 minutes because a female is working double shifts to put food on the table doesn't mean that that's an abusive household as someone who's from from money coming and you don't know what's going on behind those closed doors. Right. Yeah, and like, it's, and yeah. this movie showed that like, yeah, she presented like, and the cops were like, Oh, we're so sorry. And then they go up and they, well, what about this little girl's room? And without any question, they bought the story of, yeah, yeah. She died. And we just kept the room like that. If they had gone to that apartment building of where fool lived, I can guarantee that story would have never fucking flown. Nope. They would have been right. investigating everything. Right. So I think yeah. that to me, I got the child abuse piece, but then when I watched it as an adult, I got further more of how you look. And this isn't just about race because poverty has a look to it. Yep. Mm-hmm. As I'm sure your wife can speak to Darren because of her work and how you present yourself changes. And if you present yourself as someone with quote unquote education, people will treat you different. They'll treat you different for how you're dressed, how you big groomed. house. Yeah. Or even your hygiene. Do you yeah. have good teeth? Like it, it comes down to so many different factors, right? And I just think this movie does a really good job of capitalizing on that, but packaging it as this little like adventure where you get behind this little kid named Fool and, you know, it has a really cute Doberman in it that I kept reminding myself was like super like adorable and that I shouldn't go look for a Doberman (laughs) to own because I just thought it was the cutest fucking dog ever. Even though it's supposed (laughs) to be like the villain, I still loved it the entire time. Um, Like, I just think that that's, he was smart how he presented his messages. He presented them in a way that people would probably get, but not be overwhelmed by. Not that I think that it's not good to have politically heavy handed films, but I think the fact that this did so well shows us that sometimes when it comes to getting viewership, heavy handed is not the way to go. Yeah. Yeah. This was the first movie that he ever had final cut on. Really? Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. interesting. So he told the story in the way he wanted to. Now he... He did acknowledge that he's like, yeah, I'm a white guy. And he's like, yeah. so I tried to get, uh, fill, fill my crew with, uh, people from all walks of life and diff- different, uh, different walks, of, uh, different paths and get input from, like, we're going to talk a little bit about, and I think what the next movie is going to be, if we're going chronologically, Yes. which it feels like. Um, a director trusting his cast and crew to sort of inform them on a life that they've never lived in the making of the movie. So he put a lot of trust in his actors to tell him if he was telling them to do something that was just like, "Mm -mm, no, (laughs) 
That's know, interesting. He, he tried to foster that sort of environment in the film. Now, of course, thinking that you're doing something and actually doing it, I, I haven't heard anybody say that he didn't do that, but mm -hmm. this is Wes Craven talking about the creation of the movie. So. Yeah. Right. Right. And I, I think he, I would hope that he did. And I think the reception of it yet again, just shows the, the ability that he had to story tell and pull in politics. I actually think this is a really good, if you don't want to ruffle feathers too much and you want to make a message, this is a great example of a formula to follow in order to make a horror film that's politically minded. I feel The Purge did that too. I know as the Purge series goes on, people find it more political, especially election year, which yeah. is you know, all that's about one politics. One of my favorites of the series. Right? Yeah. One of my favorites too. Like I like more politics, the better for me. It just fuels my angry Heather fire. But <laughs> for some people that doesn't work for them, right? And and there is, you know, art being subjective. So I do think this film did a good job in 1991 um, of presenting the issues that it presented. And there's still that bath scene, as I said earlier, it still gets to me. It still upsets the steam me. coming out of that yeah tub. Oh. yeah oh. and then just her screams oh right and the kids like seeing what's happened to them um yeah that's just that's just a real personal challenge for me when i watch these films yeah i i can see that it's been a few years since i had rewatched this but i'm glad i glad i chose it for this one because yeah there was a lot to un unwrap with it well, it's interesting that you chose two films so close together in the early 90s, and then we chose two films so close together in the late 2010s-isms, or 10s or whatever, yeah. uh, closer to 2020. So let's move into our, our 2018 film that we're going to talk about. All right, so this is the one that our good friend Darren picked. Um, boy, is this a doozy of a film. Uh, yep. So what we're talking about is Assassination Nation, released September 21st, in 2018 in salem usa four friends fight to survive when a malicious hacker exposes everyone's secrets on the internet and causes their town to descend into chaos that is uh pretty much a really good synopsis for this because this one is pretty much showing like the showing everybody in this town their dirty little secrets or quote unquote dirty little secrets where some get just blown out of proportion um, but man, talk about like having like so many different social commentary, political issues just wrapped into one freaking film. This is mm -hmm. a Darren pick for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this has so many things that can just be discussed just from this, like just from this one film. Um, but Darren, since you picked this, I got to know, like, what are your thoughts? I, well, I picked it because I at least like it a little bit, but I almost slept on this movie, like like we said in our our thread, and I can't even remember. I think it was the one of the posters. I saw one of the posters. The commercial. I don't really remember the trailer. I don't always go after trailers, but I don't actively avoid trailers. Right. Um. I was like, oh, okay, that's probably something cool. But uh, what 2018 in September. I was mostly chasing around uh, a three-year-old. So I wasn't getting out to the movies all the time. <laughs> but as soon as it was available on streaming, one of those nights at you know, it was midnight, one o'clock, something like that, I sat down, threw it on, and was like, fuck. <laughs> yeah. And That's it's just good reaction right there. <laughs> Yeah, it, it just ticks so many boxes for me. There's, you know, parallels with the Salem witch trials. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, it's it's like a music video, political everything. And it, yeah, I mean, uh, it's strong female leads. I like that. Uh, cool music. I like that. Shitty politicians getting things happen to them, you know, especially like... Uh, I mean, the the one dude, I, this is probably one that fewer people have seen, so I'm trying to be pretty vague, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from the first-time watcher. So, <laughs> I mean, this this movie deals with the male gaze, and you could talk about that within the film and coming from a male writer-director uh, who did uh, talk with his four female leads pretty much constantly about, like, is this is this accurate? Is this close? Is this something that... You would say, and I don't know, <laughs> he said he spent a lot of time seeing what teenage girls talked about on the internet, which sounds kind of creepy, but hopefully he did it in a room with other researchers and it wasn't just, yeah, I'm Sam Levinson looking around on the internet. You're right. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the, the narration, the 
allusions to all sorts of shit going on in modern politics but like i said also talking about salem witch trials hysteria you know things that people keep secret aren't necessarily because there's anything to be ashamed with uh, like lily's dealing with female sexuality you're talking about just because a person is naked doesn't make it sexual unless you make it sexual yes per se Mm -hmm. and i mean the parental relationships there's all the focus on her and all the horrible shit she's done and then the creepy fucking brother talking about all sorts of weird shit like talking about people getting eaten by animals at the dinner table and they're just like oh yeah okay well i just i didn't catch that yeah boys will be boys type attitude yeah uh you know the the 10 the quote the 10 percent of the people in the world are cruel 10 percent are merciful and the other 80 percent can be swayed in either direction stands out to me every time i watch it because a lot of people just get whipped up into following the loudest voice in the room there's like yeah 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 the the way hysteria builds and yeah there's i mean this movie is really 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 realistic or you know uh I'm trying to think of a better word but it's very realistic and ludicrous at the same time but it tells of such a real story and uh i mean yeah okay trying to think uh, uh the gore the, the, the some of those scenes are like especially this this was one i thought of at first when it was time to come up with a movie i was thinking about the purge but then when i listened to your episode where you said you might choose the purge but then nobody chose the purge i figured i would wait and not pick it for this time because it wasn't chosen for a reason And then this one was, are there going to be the horror cops writing us tickets for, it's not a horror movie. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And And then I realized you guys wouldn't care and that's what matters. So (laughs) yeah, we don't give two fucks. Uh, Yeah. Uh, (laughs) And and it seemed like, you know, yeah, I almost chose Videodrome, but we were already doing Society, which sort of gets the body horror thing about elites doing things to lower class people. And uh, yeah, so I, I was stoked to talk about this movie and Heather, I did not know this was a first time watch for you. Yeah. And I also have not talked about this movie with a woman. Yeah. And I would really like to hear what you've got to say. Um, you know, when I first saw the opening scene and they gave a trigger warning and they said, you know, bullying, blood, abuse, classism, death, drinking, drug use, sexual content, homophobia, transphobia, guns, nationalism, racism, kidnapping, murder, attempted murder, swearing, torture, violence, gore, weapons, and fragile male egos. Um, I thought to myself, I'm like, this movie is coming in with something to say. Yeah. And uh I I was overwhelmed with the realism of this film. And this film is real. Make no fucking differences about this. This is realistic conversations that occur, whether you want to believe it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, it presented everyone in a real-to-life 17, 18-year-old mentality um, where not everybody is a quote-unquote bad person, but we do struggle sometimes with making the right choices or choices that are ethical. And I applaud the transgender character in this. It's the first time I've seen transgender. Personally, I thought just really ton well. Yeah, it Um, wasn't like just in your face, like, oh, we got a transgender character. And it made sense with the plot and what this person discussed being trans. Like, I'm not trans. So, you know what? I'm just assuming. So I, you know, give that as a disclaimer. But I really enjoyed their interactions with the other characters. Um, and, you know, there's some scenes where the guys and the, and the chicks are just hanging out, smoking pot, and they talk about eating pussy and how the one girl's like, the, her boyfriend doesn't eat pussy. And, you know, they have a fight about it, about he's like, how would you embarrass me like that? You know, and she's like, well, if I didn't suck your dick, you would say something. He's like, no, I wouldn't. I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, he would. Right. Totally. Like, and yeah. It's because of sexual need. If we look at that more, it's also because sexual need isn't being made. And we're not encouraged to talk about that as much, right? And they talk about, you know, watching porn to learn from porn. And I do think there is some value in watching pornography to learn about sex. But I think there's also the, it pause, it, it crosses lines when you look at certain types of pornography, right? Like we have, you know, pornography where I get as a young boy or young woman or whatever you identify as watching a sexual interaction and being like, oh, okay, like that's 
maybe how I would engage in oral sex, or that's how I would engage in anal sex, or, oh, that's, you know, a fetish that I didn't know that I was interested in. I hope I can find someone else who is consenting me into the same thing. You know, I've been exposed to things sexually through television, sexual experiences, and pornography. And I've found things, you know, arousing that I didn't think I would. So I do think there can be a healthy relationship that is had with pornography and other such things like that. But I think that this film exposes you know, that that's not the only guidelines to how sex works. And is <laughs> we get in a real dangerous area when we think that's how it is. And I think it really exposed the way that some people may feel they have ownership over another. And if that person engages in behavior that they don't agree with, they have the right to dictate what they do. I think the parent interaction with their daughter about when she talks about the little girl, like, well, a, a image is only sexual if you make it sexual. That is such a real conversation. Like, right there. like, and I was like, that's what we're still trying to learn today. And one of the things about feminism is teaching that it's not, a, it's the issue is that you don't see the female body just as a sexual being. That's what the, that's what feminism part of it is trying to get across to men, not all men, obviously, some heterosexual men who just see women as a sexual being that's there to please them. Yeah. Like that's because <laughs> it's not, we're not, you know? And I think that that is exposed well in this film. The bullying was very hard for me to watch. Uh, what happened to that principal was very hard for me to watch. Mm -hmm. uh, when tough. they're reading through his pornography list, honestly, if someone went through my pornography list too, they'd probably be like, what? Like, you know, and I'm choosing to be open about that. Like, I think that anyone could be shocked of what someone's viewed out of curiosity and then to expose it to make that person quote unquote pedophile, I don't think is fair either. I did like how they showed different forms of harassment and abuse that can happen to different people. Yeah. Right. And I think that that's important because we don't want to just unfortunately focus. Sometimes people get tired of seeing the same people who are victims, even though they are victims and they're victims more often, it's important to see that. But it's also important to understand that there are other people out there that become victims from situations that, you know, if anyone saw our search engine history at times, I'm sure people would be second guessing what they watched. Like all Scott searches is gremlins, for example. They may think that he's obsessed. <laughs> like, you know what I mean though? Like I just tried out a little comic kind of humor there, but like I I think this film did that really well. Like honestly, this film was really hard for me to digest because it was so good. Yeah, like and there's just so many fucking like topics of discussion just in this film. Like the transphobia that's there, the because yeah. of the guy with the the guy that ends up going with Bex and uh then they find out that oh you suck Bex's dick, blah blah blah. Like and they just drag him out to the street pretty much and like are gonna like beat his ass for it and then, well they were gonna hang him well no i mean they were gonna beat uh what was the diamond Di the, oh, yeah. the guy they were gonna beat yeah. his ass for doing that it's like and just like then the whole hanging of bex like it's fucking hard to watch you know what's interesting stuff. though during that scene they referred to bex as a woman Yes, I was kind of surprised that like those the entire guys time did. I was waiting for yep. some kind of transphobic slur. Yeah. And it didn't happen in that scene. Yeah, they kept saying she, her. I noted yeah. that also. I was, like, I was I was expecting those pe those pieces of shit to call her he. Yeah, or, or like or something worse. else. Yeah, or, or worse. worse. Right. Right. Yeah. Like, but I was like, I, so I don't know if that was a writer's choice that they're like, you know what? We're just not going to cross that line. Uh, we're not, but I, I yeah, it was interesting. That stood out to me. Yeah, it stood out to me too when I watched it last night. I was just like, hmm, interesting. I like they were didn't gonna hang that. her, but they were using the preferred pronouns. It was the weirdest fucking shit I had ever seen. So if they can use preferred pronouns, there's no reason why other people can't use preferred, right. preferred pronouns, right? Yeah. Um, Darren, what stands out to you in this film the most for you? Is there any particular themes that really hit home for you? For me, it was like abuse um of everyone, abuse of power, abuse of manipulation uh bullying control yeah th that and uh I, a good example is when the good people of salem as they were calling themselves were screaming about how good people they are yeah mm -hmm. while also in the next breath saying we're gonna come get you bitch we're gonna fucking kill you bitch we're good people you fucking bitch and uh, like the hysteria of uh, yeah, uh, similarly to some, some of the other themes that we've talked about, it is the danger of someone thinking that they are being oppressed when they're asked to treat people decently. 
yeah. and the lack of empathy. I think uh, o- overall through the whole movie, one of the bigger themes is the lack of empathy. You know, there's the anti-LGBTQIA politician that mm-hmm. should have more reason to be empathic because like many anti-LGBTQ crusaders, they've got a secret that they're hiding. Yep. Mm-hmm. There's mm-hmm. the lack of empathy when the uh, principal's stuff is leaked and people are doing dramatic readings of his text thread with his for her miscarriage. Mm-hmm. There's the yeah, pictures of his daughter uh, uh, that they expose as him being yeah, pedophilia. That really his... was an interesting round that he went down. The writer, yeah, and, and he just got destroyed. Yeah, he was vilified, absolutely vilified. And he was one of the good people of Salem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's um, yeah, and of course all the parallels. The uh, basically the townspeople became tiki, tiki torch carrying khaki pants wearers running through town saying we will not go away um yeah but so yeah that the the, that would be the themes i I would say stood out the most yeah like you scotty um i think you guys pretty much hit the nail nail on the head with a lot of these but uh yeah i wanted to bring up the one that uh darren brought because i for some reason i didn't put the parallels together but the whole comparison to the salem witch trials and uh what's her name the main character uh lily yeah lily like, and how she basically is, quote unquote, called out to be the witch that started all this and the hunt that goes on for her. And it's just, I never even would have put those two together, like, without this discussion. And, like, that right now really stands out to me. Because, yeah, like, they pin her as the one that's done all this when she's not. And mm-hmm. then, like, but of course, no one's going to believe her because she is so open about everything and just, like, kind of confrontational about things because of just, like, her attitude well and those those pictures were shared right so yes. she had sent those very sexualized pictures to the guy that she had been babysitting for yet again an older man in a power dynamic relationship yep and that had been exposed so now she looks like quote unquote a slut yep because we all know it's okay for women or men to have sex yep. but women can't so which is weird in a heterosexual relationship i don't know who the men are having <laughs> sex with <laughs> right. but anyway um so i you know she's seen as like um the scarlet weather kind of thing right she's she's seen as less than and i think the scene where that guy's cat calling her and being a real piece of shit and she's running and running yes. and then she hides and he has a fucking knife and like anyone who tells me oh that one happened yeah that shit does happen okay women get fucking harassed all the time just look up stats it, it's a thing yeah um, let alone trans people on how much they get harassed. But anyway, and then she fucking smashes him in the face with a shovel. I thought that was the best scene. But then when you see that the little boy's watching, it kind of adds that, oh, now this kid just witnessed this violence. But at the same time, you know, like there's so many layers. Yeah. Like it's not, you could be like, yeah, she fucked him up with a shovel. Good for her. But now this child has witnessed this violence. How did it get to this point in the first place? You know, like this movie was just layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. And the parents, how they treat her when those pictures are exposed and they come home, the acting in that fucking scene. Oh man, that was so like, holy shit. More people need to watch this movie for the fucking acting of all these actors, all of them. They were all great. They, you believed that they were who they pretended to be. And that's yeah. incredible to to do that. And we're, we're dragging her out of the house and locking her out. Like, fucking well done. Like, their reaction as antagonists and her reaction as, like, a protagonist, incredible. Yeah. The, incredible. the short-sighted parental solution right? to a problem you see in your child by throwing them out to fend for themselves. Which is reaccurate. Like, accurate. Like, I... Uh, dealing uh, my friend's stepdaughter has gone through something similar with her biological mother right it's and my friends are there to support her um who like her her dad and her stepmom but like and have made sure she's not on her own but like it's it happens like that shit happens and i just think that this film does a really good job of explore ex, of exposing it and i even think the basically setting up to do that trans execution scene i want to give credit to those male actors who play who portrayed the role that they did because they were believable. Yeah. You believed that they hated Bex. You believed 
that they had this kind of hate within them. And that's a sign of a good actor. Like yeah. when, when you can be such a good antagonist that people are like, yeah, I fucking buy you. Or um, our buddy was in it, Joel. Joel McHale. No, Joel McHale, fucking creeper. Like yeah. shit, he's like, he plays so many different types of roles. And for the small role he had in this, he was effective. Yeah. And I was going to say like, uh, this kind of stands for the argument that he could have been the villain in Becky. Like, because i've heard yeah. people say that before but yeah like he shows he could too but he yeah like, been, yeah you're right but yeah like uh you're right with this like the, he was because you it's uh he's got a small role but he's kind of the one that kind of instigates the whole fucking like chaos that ensues yeah it shows very much mob mentality it's this movie is a ride though i i want to make this very clear this when they give that trigger warning at the beginning they're not fucking around no there's like, a reason it is, <laughs> It was hard to sit through. And this is real life horror, which I consider very much horror. It was hard for me to watch. It's definitely one of my favorite films of all time, but it's hard for me to view for sure. Yeah. And yeah, I, I there's a lot of discourse around the whole trigger warning thing. And I kind of like the idea that it's not an insult to your, you as a person's capability to whatever. It's more of a courtesy because some shit is extremely traumatic and you just can't if some people want to know it's it's like people look at how a movie is rated before they watch it yeah. or something like that i i think it's yeah i i again sort of like you were talking or we've talked about with the whole cancel culture consequence culture i think people can say trigger warning with a hostility in their in their throats mm-hmm. towards it and I, I think it's more of a courtesy than an insult to anybody yeah, this right. film is basically just saying this is what we're going to show you. This may affect this may affect somebody that is viewing this. And there's nothing what? wrong yeah. with murder, rape, bullying, um, violence affecting you as a person. Let's make this clear. There's a reason why soldiers have PTSD when they come back from fucking war. There's a reason oh, why man. people who grow up in traumatic situations do. I am so thank you for being out of that, Taryn, but I'm so fucking tired of people acting like something is wrong with you if you don't like seeing gratuitous violence or rape or something like that. It there's nothing wrong with you. There's human beings aren't actually generally speaking meant to watch stuff like that which is why we tend to generate towards things that are happier and easier or this movie would have made more money this movie only made two million dollars in the united states of america there's a reason because it's a hard movie to sit through and it's hard for many reasons but i think the trigger warning helped me personally it personally for me it just prepared me for what i was walking into yeah, and uh, and it also plays in with well, I don't want to say yeah, like I already knew since it's the first time I've heard your opinion on it, but I I agree. It sort of, it sets a tone, and it also plays along with the style of the movie. You know, we get mm-hmm. people's Instagram and text message pop ups on the screen. There's the uh, after her leak. There's all the you got a friend request, friend request, friend request, comment, comment, comment. It it fits with with the theme of the movie also I think and like Absolutely. you said with the whole traumatized people I mean one um, like I said in my in my introduction I sort of bounced around in college <laughs> and when I switched from journalism to English lit and creative writing I ended up being in two classes with a veteran in my creative writing class and his shit was dark mm-hmm. it was very dark. He was working through a lot of shit. Uh, we ended up um, after our final class together, uh, you know, going out to the bar and talking. And he was even lightening things up for the class. Yeah. Because he was, you know, like I finished. Uh, he was I forget how long he was in Afghanistan, but he's working through a lot of shit. And yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And people have those experiences, right? And you can have traumatic experiences living in a, in a mediocre, like what would other people would see as a mediocre life, which is what these girls kind of had, you know, before everything happened with the hack and all this other stuff. And I love at the end that it's the brother and we give spoilers in this. So everyone knows that listens to our podcast. And I think it's just (laughs) interesting that he says, I did it for the LO, like the lols. 
for yeah. the walls. Right. Yeah. Um, it just puts a nice little bow on top. And then the 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 Salem High School marching band performing We Can't Stop Down the Street Littered with Dead and Bodies and Destroyed Vehicles. Like this movie was like basically a love letter to me. And Darren, you may not know what my opinion was going to be, but you had a pretty damn good idea through the conversations that we've had, <laughs> I'm sure, on what I was going to think of this film. Yeah, I, <laughs> I felt confident in picking it. I know I joked about uh, you not letting me be on the show after picking it, but I knew that you also, yeah, from, from conversations, you will confront uncomfortable things as long as it serves a purpose in the story. Absolutely. You know, gratuitous, uncomfortable. And, and that's another thing that we're, I know we're not wrapping up. We still got another movie to talk about, but that was another thing that I was thinking about with some of the, queasiness people have about socio-political messages in movies especially amongst horror fans mm -hmm. because you will always hear oh man that movie made me feel like shit i love it yeah and and this is a different kind of thing you know it's yeah it was like but i don't want to watch this because i i don't it makes me feel bad yeah it's like well I'm lacing my fingers together, ladies and gentlemen. I forgot, but this is for everybody that's watching right now. You too. This I, I don't know why you can't have one without the other or and yeah. and then exclude the other. Yeah, Absolutely. I completely agree. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought this to the table. I do strongly recommend it. But just be aware of the trigger warning at the beginning. Know what you're getting into because it is a tough watch. Um, but well acted, well written, and it's a shame that. Uh, I'm, but I'm not surprised that it didn't make more money. Simply because it's a it's a hard thing to watch. There's one thing to watch Jason run through a forest and slice a bunch of camp counselors, <laughs> and there's another thing to watch something like this. Right? That's just reality. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Right? There's a reason why yet again, People Under the Stairs was packaged in a formula that was much more palatable and um, easier to consume especially with a lot of this being based on people's online lives versus mm -hmm. real life lives and the connect the connections between them but i i know there's a part where she's where lily says you want to try saying that in real life or something like that or you want to uh, it was, oh, fuck i can't remember anyway there there are a lot of nods to well, that's online. It, it's not the same as real life. But how you treat somebody online represents who you are, even if you pretend that it doesn't. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you so much for bringing this to the table, Darren. You did not disappoint. Yep. And like I said, I was excited as hell to talk about this one because I knew there was a lot to unpack in this. And I was excited to hear Heather's thoughts on this because I knew she had not seen it yet. But I guess we can uh, move on to our final film of our main topic. And that is Us, released March 20th. 2019. Adelaide Wilson and her family are attacked by mysterious figures dressed in red. Upon closer inspection, the Wilsons realize that the intruders are exact lookalikes of themselves. Uh, so, yep, this is a the sophomore effort from Jordan Peele uh, right after his success with Get Out. And once again, this man just layers his film with messages that uh, sometimes some people may not totally understand. I am referring to myself because this one went over my head at first and I had to do some research on it because uh, my honest opinion, like I, when I first watched this, I thought this was okay. Could have been with the company that I was with at the time because she did not enjoy it. Um, but at the same time, I just didn't get it, honestly. But the second watch, I read up on it beforehand. I watched it. I listened to a couple podcasts before that kind of did deep dives on this. And this film went way up in my eyes and the... The messages behind it are definitely a little more subtler than some, like especially some of the films that we've talked about, but like really freaking spot on. Um, but yeah, once again, like I've been doing, I'll pass this over to Darren. Uh, what are your thoughts on Us? Yeah, I saw, I missed this in the theater, but I saw a Get Out in the theater twice. Nice. I, I was immediately a Jordan Peele fan. I think comedians lend themselves well to horror because a lot of it is timing and storytelling and the the path you know uh, there's there's telling the story and horror needs well doesn't need to have moments of levity to give you a break give you a, a time to breathe or anything like that but yeah with, with us oh man yeah I, I know this is a big movie for heather so I'm, I'm trying not to overstep anything that she would say better than i but you go I, ahead I, 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 
like as you see i'm a big alice in wonder well you might not be able to see because it's dark in my little cave but i'm a big alice in wonderland fan i like all the allusions to that in the film there i mean there's the fucking rabbits there's the going down the hole there's absurdities i, I mean there's so much so much good to say about this movie also like you first time i watched it my company loved it but we were like did you do you know exactly what he's saying it's like no does that make you like it less no it does not make me like it less but i can't say oh yeah i know exactly what it's about but then when you when you go into it or you know uh, i watched a lot of i watched all of the special features on my blu-ray uh, i don't know if either of you have seen uh, people talk about it much or the way that the movie was made or anything like that but you know he he's a very smart director uh, he's a big fan of horror and i think you can you can see that in the things he does i mean he was talking about uh, you know a tale of two sisters uh, nightmare on elm street and alien being some movies that he was thinking about being heavily influenced by influenced by in his his horror making and his obsession with doppelgangers and how doppelgangers have existed through folklore forever as yeah. often a sign of a bad omen or just explain uh, exploring the duality of humans and uh, with us i mean when there's an us there's a them and just all these little things ignoring ignoring your privilege or not noticing your privilege where um that one thing that he said was a lot of people like to think that everything they have they deserve and that's not always the case you know sometimes people suffer for someone else to live the cushy vacation house life or the uh stuff like the hands across america theme that that's in the movie i don't i was too young to really remember that but Same. it is it does i think speak to another part of the story that he's trying to tell which is a lot of people not everybody uh, so i don't want to just say people but a lot of people like to think that big dramatic symbolic gestures help more than actually doing something to help people oh yeah and i i kind of feel like that's a little bit of what hands across america represents in the film because it was what supposed to battle world hunger somehow uh, it, yeah I don't know. something like that and just the the play uh you know they they did each character did their own parts twice which is impressive um, as shit lupita nyong'o yep if that's how you say her last name uh she always did her dominant whichever character of hers was dominating the scene first that way she could react to that already having been there and whenever she was red she was red no matter if the camera was on or not uh there are a lot of deleted there's a lot of deleted footage of her sitting around waiting for them to shoot and she's just crying or you know it was fascinating wow to see the dedication that the characters put into playing their characters and i mean you could tell that they had fun making it but it's a fucking terrifying movie <laughs> yeah and, uh, like the the daughter i forget what the daughter's doppelganger character was but that oh she was frightening that smile yes oh uh, that smile and, gave me the creeps and uh, playing off the mirrors and uh, you know the just all the little nitpicky things or not nitpicky attentions to detail like the the dance that she did the ball the ballet that she did is supposed to be two people dancing together but she did it alone oh but she didn't do it alone because her tethered was doing it right underground while she was doing it on stage and just all this fucking shit so always happy to talk about this movie uh every time i've watched it i've noticed something different yeah like the like i also enjoy just like the uh symbology that's given throughout this movie of like the parallels the 11 11 the frisbee landing perfectly in the circle and the, on the beach blanket and just like little nods like that too just to kind of represent like the parallel lives that are like being lived and like i i uh i also understand if i remember correctly he was saying uh 
saying like this film was also kind of a uh, nod to uh, or not a nod, but like a poke at us Americans for the fear of the invader. Yeah. And like just uh, other people coming into our world. And yeah, I can totally see that. And how people can't be ultimately good because we are animals and no matter how much we fight it, we are tribalistic. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, I want, uh, you know, like you, you can, anybody can say that they want the ultimate good for everybody. But if it comes to protecting those in your house and somebody outside, a lot of people don't. Yeah, they don't. Yeah. Uh, Heather, you're the one that picked this. I want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, um, I'm a big Jordan Peele fan. I like how he's not afraid to make things uncomfortable. I thought Get Out was a great example of uncomfortable racism. And I think that this fan, this movie is a, a great example of uncomfortable classism. And I think both of you did a really great job of highlighting, A, the acting of this film and the writing. Gabe's character, the husband, has appropriate comedic relief and appropriate mm-hmm. reflection of privilege. And privilege isn't necessarily a bad thing. No. You know, I have privilege and I'm open about that. And I've had a lot of blessings because of my privilege, but people suffer for others to have. And I think that's what, well, we know that's what Jordan Peele was trying to express because he said it in interviews. <laughs> but when we look at even the underground representation of the tethered and the scene specifically where um Adelaide goes missing at the beginning as a little girl at the theme park or the and you're seeing down below what the people who are the tethered are engaging in yeah which is similar activities without the benefit or when she talks about the when they got toys my toys were sharp and hurt my hands when I Mm. chose a partner and Poverty breeds poverty. I think Darren's wife could come on and talk about this from being a social worker. Poverty has a look to it. I uh, go particularly to a park that's close to my girlfriend's place. And uh, there's um, a lot of impoverished areas there. And the kids look different. It's called neglect. Yeah. And neglect is something that I don't think people who come from poverty do purposely all the time. Obviously, there are cases and people can argue with me on that. But I think there is a situation of not having enough food, not having clothes that fit, not having the hygiene, not having the language. One of the biggest things that people have is that ability to make small talk. And Adelaide is the, the white woman is trying to make small talk with her. That's something that we did the moment we got on this podcast. Darren's yeah. like, oh, man, it's hot. That's small talk, right? Like Darren and me and Scott have been raised in families where we've learned how to do small talk. We're all white and we all get it. Now, there are people who are raised from other ethnic groups as well that know how to do small talk as well. I'm just giving us as an example because we're here. Adelaide struggled with that because as we find out later, yet again, spoiler, she was the original tethered. So she has never learned that from the real developmental ages that is what one to six and you know it's it's very much about her struggling with that piece and you know this white family and and there's not really I liked how they were there and they were kind of the side family and I did find their scenes funny like the beach boys playing and fuck the police like it was funny like and that's the thing about Jordan Peele he knows how to sprinkle in that razzle dazzle of humor with also giving a message Right. Right. And unfortunately, sometimes that's what you need to do. You need to like um, when you're taking a pill, you need to put it down with a little bit of peanut butter so people will actually want to swallow it, (laughs) you know, or whatever the case may be. Chocolate coated pills, I guess, is a better example. So you're able to be like, "Mm, that wasn't that bad, but I get it now. And I feel like Jordan Peele just does that really well. And I think that the rabbit thing I've never fully got, um, maybe it's the Alice in Wonderland thing. That's a really good point. I've never got the significance to the rabbits. I, I always just focused on, A, I was happy that he used a Black family coming from means. Thank fucking God. Um, we didn't need to watch more white people coming from means or anything else like that. It was <laughs> nice to see a Black family. And they were funny. They were likable, yeah. right? And even the white family that they brought in, they were likable too. Everyone was likable. You know, you, you you would you understood the husband and wife ranting. Like you got that that was like a typical marriage argument that would happen, you know? And it, I thought that that was well done. And their other halves of them were funny too. Like the part where he goes to give her the hand and then like runs his hand through his hair. Like there were just <laughs> certain, certain things that were funny and you made people like them. It wasn't openly about race like get out was no this was you know they had something to do with it of course but like it was more about past and 
how when you have things, other people don't have things and this is what their lives can look like and resentment that could be built. And what would happen if there was somebody who was able to unify them and rebel, right? So it, I, I just find the movie really entertaining for those factors and creepy as fuck. Like the fight scenes and the, and the creepy scenes are, are good. Like when they're being stalked in their house in that first couple of minutes when the family's standing at the top of their driveway, it's a perfect mix of humor and creepiness. Yeah. Yeah, because I was going to say the guy that played the father did that, like, like you great. said, did that well. Yeah, he did He's that. He's so fucking funny. Like some of the shit he says... <clears throat> is just so funny and real yeah like that was the thing it was a real conversation that a family would have yeah because that'd be like that, that's <laughs> kind of like the thing i would say <laughs> sorry what was that darren well like when the daughter's like nobody wants our boat dad i know he's like you can have the boat and when she says nobody wants the boat like writing like that is just Mwah. you know like it's just fucking perfect timing of what would actually be said in that situation it's like it's like kind of the concept of, of um so people under the stairs making it palatable because they're making it funny while giving a message as well. Yeah. Yeah. And that, like you said, that's what Jordan Peele's great at. He's great at delivering the message, giving you the scares and like saying how it is, but just like with his leaning of, into comedy, like he does and just sprinkling the humor in, like even with get out, like the, like, the stuff that there's like the white folk are saying like about like they're being racist but the way they're saying it's kind of funny because it's just like the dumb white guy that doesn't know what he's talking about like oh i would i would have voted for obama for a third time if it was possible and stuff like that like yeah it's like yeah it's just the way that he writes dialogue it's real it's funny and it's like also serious at the same time and the and the and the like the filming of the dancing at the end like fuck that scene is so good yeah like it's just such a well-made film and i know that it came out the same year that midsummer did and i believe like there's i've heard some rumblings that they're up against each other in summer series is that accurate darren um i see somewhere i will look i've got the master list that is public knowledge it's not in any of my years but we do have the list of all of the nominees so because as we I, talk, I will look. Because I think those are two very different films. Yeah. Right? And I think that they both play on issues that are very relevant. And the acting in them is both incredible, and the writing is incredible, and the direction is incredible. And I think it really does come down to uh, which politics are you more behind? Yeah. And which issues are you more behind personally? Um, and I'm not a huge Midsommar fan. Uh, I respect the film quite a bit. I It won my top director on Super Party Massacre because I think you know, you need to give dues where they're due. Yeah. Right. And, but it's not my preference. Us would be, uh, but that's also because it speaks more of the Heather language and what I care about more personally myself. Right. So. Yep. Where Midsummer for me, like would probably be mine. Cause or just how, how it hits me. Cause it under, I understand like the, how realistic they portrayed anxiety and mm-hmm. like emotions. Absolutely. Right. I look forward to seeing Jordan Beals. Well, now he's a producer on Candyman, but I'm sure he had some kind of creativity input as a producer. Uh, So it'll be interesting to see that product that he's kind of part of come out. But I look forward to more films by him. I think Us is a film that uh, is entertaining to watch and also has a little bit of a message to it. And what did we think about the ending with the hands across America, the tethered? I was... I was going to bring that up when we were talking about the hands across America. Like, I think showing the tethered do it is showing like, uh, they, like the, like, I, I almost want to say it's almost like, uh, Jordan Peele, like hinting at like, like, Oh no, Scott, Scott got lost. Uh Oh, they Hi, got Scott. to him. They got to him. Now Scott can't, Scott's tethered came and took him. Scott. No. Oh, oh wait, oh, he's wait. back. Is it Scott? Or is. It, it's his tethered. Which Scott is it? I don't know. Go. <laughs> There once was a movie called Gremlins, and Heather didn't want to listen to it anymore. Anyway. But they forgot about (laughs) Gremlins 2. Jordan Peele did a skit with that. (laughs) Do you remember what you were going to say? (laughs) What was that though, Heather? Do you remember what you were going to say? I think it was about... uh, Hands across America, like I think what it was with Jordan Peele saying, like the invaders, like almost showed like the invaders showed unity where it shows an American since the hands across America failed miserably that we could not unite. It's almost kind of what I was thinking, like others can unite where our country seems to always be divided. Interesting. I, I that's a great interpretation. Yeah, like that's the only like, like I don't know if there was actually that 
was meant to be anything or not, but that's kind of something I see. Interesting. Anything you want to add, Darren, before we I move would, to our out of the dark? I would like to add that I am looking at the nominees for 2019. And if this list, which was a document posted to the group, so it should be the master list, us is not on it. Really? Yeah. Midsummer wow. is. Uh, yeah. Huh. Huh. Well, I guess we're going to have to send the tethered after. <laughs> summer series just kidding yeah. they are it would have been have it would have been on if i was on that year I'll, thanks I'll, darren I mean, that's what i would add thanks darren <laughs> awesome well people are allowed to have their opinion scott likes midsummer exactly. more than than i do so you know and yeah, scott sometimes I, I am has not good one taste. of those sometimes i am not one of those your opinion on liking this movie is wrong i will just say not for me yep exactly, exactly right exactly how we do it exactly because Scott and I are classy, just like you, Darren. That's fucking right. Classy. So our <laughs> Out of the Dark segment is each of us are going to bring a politically themed movie and provide a short spoiler-free review of the movie. So I can go if you guys want me to go first. Scott, if you want to go first. I wasn't going to make Darren go first. We made him go first a lot. So... Oh, that's the that's the uh, curse of being the guest on our the show. Curse of the guest, yeah. The so it's, getting, it's getting me ready. It's getting me ready for... The summer series. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I can go right now. Uh, I actually have my movie all pulled up. It's not Gremlins, right? <sighs> How'd you know? Fuck my life. <laughs> we'll find well, a mean, way. We'll find. I, 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 I I'll, I'll, I'll get you. We'll do the politics of the Gremlins franchise. Oh, I was going to say, I mean, Gremlins 2 does have politics about consumerism. Okay, will you stop and just read what your movie is? <laughs> um, the movie I ended up going with is one that I actually watched for the first time this year uh right around the time we did our pets and horror when i was doing the dive and watching all the different pets and horror films and it's the uh 1982 film white dog like i just uh this one just had that like message like that just was heartbreaking as well because it's about this uh white dog like all white dog that was unfortunately trained to hate all black people and would attack them on sight and would try to kill them. And this uh, woman ends up getting the dog and like, it's the most friendliest dog in the world. But like when as soon as it seemed like another black person, it would become extremely aggressive and deadly. So she ended up having to take it. uh, Like he almost gotten taken away from her. So she, what she did is she ended up taking him to this uh, dog training facility where this uh, black man would pretty much like deal with this dog personally to try to untrain it of what it's been taught throughout its life. And what it go, what, what the story shows is just like how unfortunately like racism can be bred into somebody just from like, just constant training and talking, like just being around somebody that's racist and like it can, and it shows that it can be un, undone, but it is a lot of work. And like, but yeah, this film was just like one of those films for me that I think also because I am such a softy when it comes to animals, seeing something like this portrayed in a creature that doesn't know any better. Mm-hmm. And it just like, it's so freaking heartbreaking to watch, but like the message there is just so freak, freaking strong. And, you know, this is one of those films that was on the horror cast top 100 hidden gems. And there's a reason this is a hidden gem. Like this needs to be seen because it's like, it's a very tough watch. But man, is the message strong and just like it hit me in the fucking feels. I remember you talking about this in our Pets and Horror show. Yeah, I if I can get a copy of this, this will be in my collection. Really? And you don't collect a lot of physical media anymore. No, but this one is just something that just struck a chord with me. And I have thought about this movie like since I've seen seen it for the show. And I've been wanting to rewatch it again already. Wow. Even though even though it's a hard watch, but like Darren said earlier, us for horror fans, like, oh, this film made me feel extremely uncomfortable and like feel so bad, but I love it. Awesome. Awesome. Darren, would you like to go next or would you prefer I go? Um, I guess I can go. If you don't care, I can go that way. You can go and then you're already in control for the next stage. Of... I'm always in control, Darren. <laughs> <laughs> I could um, sorry, Darren. I couldn't be so sad. No, that, no, that is that is perfect. That is a perfectly good point. This this is one that I spent a lot of time changing my mind on what I was gonna say. Uh, I mean, I 
tried to keep it in the horror the horror realm because when you get into political thrillers and stuff there's a whole whole new thing oh yeah <laughs> so speaking of ones that people don't i was trying to think of something that people don't talk about that much and then i was thinking about somebody said somebody was talking about tusk the really? kevin smith movie and said that kevin smith can't shouldn't try to make horror movies he should stick to comedy so I decided, well, you know, I could think about it, think about it, think about it, whatever. Red State is a movie that I love. I think Red State is awesome. I think it sucks that it's out of print and not really available. I mean, you can get, I, I think, uh, fortunately for the region-free people, you can get it from other countries, but it's not on any of the streaming. You can't buy it on iTunes or Amazon. Wow. Or Apple or I, I don't even really know why, but I am a reformed Catholic schoolboy, so religious horror ticks a box for me. People being the real monsters ticks a box for me. Michael Parks is fucking awesome. <laughs> that ticks a box for me. And yeah, I, I just think, uh, okay, so Red State is 2011 horror movie kind of making fun of the Westboro Baptist Church, um, which for those who are not familiar, they're the people that would protest funerals of gay kids that would kill themselves or other things like that, saying God hates you, but not even in that nice of a way. And it explores the idea of religious fanaticism and like we've talked about earlier a somebody thinking that they are being righteous by doing something worse to somebody than the thing that they're that they're being punished for and uh it takes place in america uh, it's young boy you said it, uh, like a, the the basic rough review it's been a little while since i've seen it somebody stole my dvd of it so i didn't Aww. get to rewatch it before today um but you know michael parks john goodman is in it i love him in a movie and it just sort of explores what so uh, to an extreme the sorts of things that happen behind church doors and uh you know the how few things are i, I think i said this before how few things are as dangerous as a villain who thinks they're the hero yeah yeah for sure Absolutely. It's a great movie. I, I was on Exploding Heads earlier this year and we covered Red State. Um, oh, okay. And I, first, a... time, first time I watched it and I really enjoyed it. Yeah, this is actually another one that I almost picked for our show. But I knew you would cover I... it from Exploding Heads, so I didn't want you to have to cover it again right away. Mm -hmm. Well, that was nice. And I saw how difficult it was to get one's hands on, so that's why, uh, why I considered it but didn't pick it. Uh, yeah, I didn't realize it was out of print. Yeah, you can. Yeah, I think you can get a Region Two Blu-ray of it for twenty or thirty dollars. But the American DVDs and Blu-rays are up around you know sixty, eighty, hundred bucks used. Wow. Yeah, and that that's funny because I just looked up a uh, White Dog, and that's only Region uh, B. There is no Region A versions of it right now. Everything's out of print. So another down with America thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> Boo, America. Boo. And the um, other eight or nine countries that are in region A. Boo, other eight, nine countries. Boo, that. Canada's in there too. So damn it. Boo, Boo Canada, Canada, America. Canada, boo. <laughs> but my movie is yay, Canada, yay. Sander Kane. Hope you're listening because this is a Canadian film, Sander uh -oh. Kane. <laughs> so my film is Slack. This is a 2020 film that came out this year. And this is a film that really capitalizes not only on consumerism, it also capitalizes on the front that a lot of companies put that they're doing things, um, you know, they're being sustainable and they're giving back to the community that they're taking stuff from, which is usually a bunch of bullshit at the end of the day. So I really like how this movie capitalizes on that, as well as it actually capitalizes on body image. The oh, yeah. point of this film is about a pair of jeans that will mold to your ass that will make it look ideal. And it physically fits you like it has this hyper smart technology that will customize to your bum and make it the best bum it can possibly be, indicating that you're not okay how you currently are and you need stuff to modify you to make yourself look better. Uh, it has everything from idealistic employees to asshole regional managers. So it, it capitalizes on retail very well. 
consuming and how little people really do care about where products come from. It's a 2020 watch, 2020 watch, it's our 2021 watch. It came out in 2020. It was released in the Canadian theaters because it is a Canadian film. Uh, back last year, we could have theaters open for that period of time. And I think it's a really fun consumerism film. And I think it's worth a watch. So if you haven't seen it, it's a 73 minute runtime. Uh, not everyone's going to love it. I love it. I think it's great. I, it's I love I love particularly how they make fun of the Roots company in Canada a lot. This is definitely a dig at Roots. I confirmed with another Canadian that they also agreed with me that this was a dig at Roots. So that made me feel a lot better. Um, <laughs> and Roots is oversized, overpriced sweatpants and hoodies that they sell that are Canadian made with sustainable practices. So I thought this was great and I encourage other people to watch it. Darren, I know you haven't had a chance to watch a lot of 2021s. I think you'll find this funny. I think you and your wife should watch it. If anyone's ever worked retail, they'll even find it funny because it makes fun of retail pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, this is a freaking hilarious and yeah. pretty gory movie too. <laughs> yeah, the special effects are pretty decent too for what it is. I mean, for a movie about killer genes, <laughs> yeah. it's still entertaining as shit and it's got a good message. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Absolutely. And yeah, I guess that kind of brings us to our natural conclusion of our episode. So Scott and I would like to very, 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 very much thank Darren for being here today. Darren brought so much to our show, but Darren also has supported us right from the beginning. And yes, Darren, you have, you have made me feel so welcome and so comfortable. And you've really made me feel good about myself as a podcaster and just as a person at times. And you always reach out with cool stuff, whether it's about hockey or politics or just funny stories about your family. And I appreciate all that you do. So thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, Scott, do you want to say something equally nice about Darren and try to <laughs> nah. live up to that? Nah, no, of course. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course. I was saying like, yeah, Darren, like I, I know you've been like pretty much supporting me, I think since podcast by the cemetery. Like you were welcoming, yep. trying to invite me on your show back then, but I was really, really nervous and unprepared for that at that time. <laughs> um, I just really thought you didn't want to, but we're trying to be nice. <laughs> nope. I was just very intimidated. <laughs> um, but yeah, you've always been like just a great person and like, yeah, you know, we've messaged back and forth all the time, like a lot about video games and stuff too, which I freaking love because I don't get a chance to talk nerdy gaming stuff too often until I got this uh, controllers up cards down show, <laughs> which we're definitely going to have to have you on at some point um, oh yeah and yeah like you've also been like heather said just extremely welcoming you were great for having me like great at being patient having me on the show like when i was extremely nervous and you've definitely gotten me to warm up a lot more and just like feel a lot more confident talking and then also oh. thank you very much for turning the smoke show into what it is now with all the <laughs> wonderful fucking photoshops which i actually have an album on my phone saved of everything that you've done just because I freaking love them so much. <laughs> oh, nice. I, I never know how long people think about those things, but... Oh, I keep them because I love make. to share them with everybody. I'm like... Scott <laughs> keeps them for multiple reasons, right? We can't talk about all of them on the podcast. I mean, we could. We could. Come join <laughs> us for, for our the, After Dark episode. Patreon paywall. <laughs> yeah, so that's our new Patreon special that we have coming out. Is Scott's going to talk about what he does with photos of himself. <laughs> That's, uh, we're hoping to get a lot more ads onto Patreon after that. You're the smoke show. Oh yeah, you're the smoke show. <laughs> now, Darren, we know you had a chance to promo at the beginning, but is there anything you wanted to add before we do our typical promos and tell people they have to subscribe to the Legion Network? Uh, well, I just wanted to thank you both for having me on here when you started announcing that you were going to work in having guests here and there. I, like, uh, as I've said, I am an avid listener. Uh, it's awesome to be on one of my favorite shows. And yeah, thank you for the time and thank you for risking letting the political nut come on your show. <laughs> and, You're our favorite nut, though. Well, and, and we also got to say, you've inspired us to be more political, like right in our intro stuff, too. Like, we're not afraid to talk politics now. Yes. That's all we're <laughs> what would Darren do is what we ask ourselves before every episode. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> But thank well, you thank again, you. Darren, for being here and for having an awesome podcast. Please check Darren out on BD Clinic, Psychosemantic Podcast, Podcast Under the Stairs, and Summer, Summer Series. Series, which is under Podcast Under the Stairs, which is an independent that you can just find by searching like iTunes and stuff, right? Yeah, he's he's everywhere. He's <laughs> everywhere. 
he is Duncan. He is his own legion. He is yes, legion. He is. <laughs> he is one where we are many. Um, <laughs> so if you haven't done it already, head on over to the Legion podcast page and hit that subscribe button for one of your feeds of choice. Scott and I will be back in the saddle again for another Patreon special with the gentleman from the TGIF um, Friday Fan Podcast. And we'll be talking about top five Canadian movies, Sander. Just letting you know. <laughs> Sander. Oh, poor Sander. Um, I love Sander. San- I, Sander is another one where if you ever want, he loves politics as well. We could have had him on this show easily. But also he has an insane knowledge of movies. Like insane. Um, I strive to have the level of knowledge that he does one day, but I'll never get there. So I just won't try. Um, <laughs> and then I don't even know what's our next episode, Scott. What are we doing? Um, what was it? We, <laughs> shit, we had something we're very professional and prepared. Was it the beach one that we were going to do? Yes, yes, that's what it was. Beach. beach. We're going to talk beach about horror. The beach. <laughs> yeah, because we had something else planned, but we pushed that back to closer to fall because it made more sense. Oh yes, yeah, something else planned. Ooh, I like how you're giving the tease there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so please join Darren, myself, and Scott at the Legion Podcast Network and become a patron. If not, like, what are you waiting for? Uh, there's some what awesome are you stuff. waiting for? <laughs> <laughs> there's some awesome stuff on the Patreon from uh, Cinema PsyOps, as well as Bo Ramsell, as well as the Friday Nightmare Podcast and other of our Legion friends. So please come join us today. It's $3 a month and it's worth the monies. Agreed. Am I right, Scotty? Agreed. <laughs> and I did a video. None of these two have done a video yet. So go join the YouTube <laughs> channel for my video on the top five female protagonists from 2010 to 2020. Because I thought Bo wanted us to do videos and I submitted one. So far, I'm the only one. So hopefully someone else submits a video. <laughs> well, right. either way, the video was fucking awesome. So you did a great job. Right. I did it for Scott and I. Everything I do is actually on behalf of Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, I, I'm not I, saying that. <laughs> I just, I know you're not. I'm teasing you, Scotty. <laughs> Though it is, in all fairness, it is. Because if Scott did a video, it would just be his top five characters from Gremlins. You know what? You should do that, Scott. You know how many people fucking love your Gremlin shit? You mm. should do top five yeah. characters from Gremlins. That's not a bad idea. Like, it's actually. a good idea. It's something different. <laughs> yeah, that I like that. Hmm. See? I will have to, I'll have to think on this. See? Oh, it's going to all... take him a month to get it straight. Right? He's like, I just don't know between the two movies. It's just so challenging. Got to go back to the tape. <laughs> Got to rewatch right. him over and over again. He's <laughs> like, until I get my lips by the eyes. <laughs> Fuck summer series. Scott needs to watch Gremlins and Gremlins <laughs> too 15 times this summer. <laughs> Damn right I do. <laughs> Here's how and... Mike from Breaking Bad is the same guy that's the cop in Gremlins. Yes. He had to leave the town in shame <laughs> and become. <laughs> That's awesome. That's oh, awesome. Love well, it. until next time, what do you say to the good people, Scotty? Well, until next time, would you like to join us for the shunting? <laughs> Unpleasant <laughs> dreams. <laughs> of all the movies. That's the one you chose. <laughs> all right. Bye. Bye. <laughs>